So what you're saying is the FBI owns Bitcoin. <laughs> yes, 100%. So and it is like right out of the gate, you guys knew this is going to be a challenge. The rise of crypto is, is the reason for ransomware. Right around the start of Silk Road, someone had posted on a forum that said they needed help running a web server type thing. Could you reach out at ross.albrick at gmail.com? So when you walk out of the cafe, you go left. He's, he's right there. In the crosswalk. In the crosswalk. We, 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 we cross. And you have the arrest warrant with you. It's in my pocket. And you don't say I let him anything. go. Okay, why? All right, guys. Bang, bang. I've got Chris here with me. Uh, you are known as the guy who took down a bunch of these bad people on the internet. Uh, some people think they're bad. Some people think they're not. It's all super controversial. Uh, you've had incredible experiences, both, I think, in kind of the rise of your career, but then also blowback for a bunch of stuff that happened. Uh, I would love to first just start with, like, what the fuck is the dark web, <laughs> right? Like all of these groups, all these things, everyone hears about the dark web on the internet. What is the dark web? So people talk about the dark web and the deep web. Okay. The deep web is pretty much anything that can't be reached by Google. It's not indexable. I mean, they, they, there's always a picture of an iceberg online and, you know, the internet that Google sees is that little tip of the iceberg above the water. And then the deep web is beneath that, the, mm -hmm. the stuff under the, the military industry. Um, you might not understand you go to the deep web all the time. Okay. If you go to your bank account, your bank account's in the deep web. Google can't index your bank account. You don't want that. You don't want Got them it. to be able to. So that's in the deep web. Then we have the dark web. The dark web, is, is for me, is where all the criminal activity happens. Okay. So you can have dot coms that are bad bad places. That's, that's mm -hmm. dark web. Um, but people traditionally talk about like Tor or hidden services and that sort of thing where really the nefarious stuff are, is going on. Okay, so we have like, let's call it Google World. Yep. Then you have the deep web. Yep. That deep web, that's just somebody who set up a website who like, let's say the bank, for example, they put up a firewall or something like that that just prevents people from being able to index it or access it? Yeah, a password. A password protected site is, is part of that, you know? So, so Google can't go through and, and, and find the site and you can't like search Anthony's bank account. Like I said, you can't get there. You can't, Google doesn't find it. Okay, so uh, it's clear to me how I get to my bank account sure. or somebody else gets to kind of these deep web stuff. The dark web. Uh, I, I was telling you earlier that uh, I have a friend who one day he's just a randomly. Friend. It's always yeah. a friend, everybody. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is like pretty good. Uh, and, and so, I mean, this kid was like incredibly smart, right? He's like playing around and everything. And like I don't, when he was accessing Tor for the first, the first time I ever saw it, I didn't know if he was like, performing and he was just doing a bunch of stuff to make it seem cooler and, sure. and better or if like it literally was multiple steps to kind of get in so like when you think about people going to the dark web let's maybe take it not from the criminal organizations but like the guy who's going to go and order weed or whatever off of uh off the dark web or, or whatever they're going to order how are they usually accessing it? Is it through a tour or is it some other service or are they using like a special computer? Like how are people doing this? So I don't want to make a roadmap for kids okay. out there to buy, buy weed. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, but to answer your question in the hypothetical, if you're 18, <laughs> if you're 18 or younger, please stop listening. <laughs> um, so it's specialized software to get on tour. It's a tour, tour bundle. Um, you download the browser um, and it just, it, it's a, it's a way of your computer talking to the network. Okay. Um, it's a special, you know. Explain that more. Cause sure. I, I think most people are like, okay, there's tour, like I've heard of it, whatever, but like, what exactly is it doing to actually be able to access a, a part of the internet, which Google's not touching, but also like criminals seem to really want to use this. Sure. So Tor operates in, in two different ways. So it's a collection of computers around the world. Normal computers that you and I would know about, they're just run running this specialized software. Mm -hmm. And there's two different things you can do on it. There's hidden services, which are called dot onions. Mm -hmm. That's just a website on, on Tor within that specialized network. But then also you can use it to access the, the, the real internet. So let's say you wanted to go to, to a site and you didn't want the government to know you were going there. You didn't want your ISP to know you were going there. Mm -hmm. You'd use Tor and you'd go through their network and you'd come out on the other end. Maybe you had an IP address that um, belonged to Germany. An IP address is just, just like a phone number for a computer. Yeah. Um, you, you go through the Tor network and you can go to Facebook or you can go anywhere you want and they can't really track you. Um, the way Tor works is it, it encrypts your traffic. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say uh, I want to talk to Three, I want to talk three places away. Mm -hmm. I take my internet traffic and use the Tor bundle, and it, it takes that information and wraps it. It puts a wrapper around it of encryption mm -hmm. and then sends it to the next node or a Tor relay. Mm -hmm. That takes that information and wraps it with more 
encryption and sends it to the next relay. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that next relay doesn't know me. It only knows that, that, that second relay, mm -hmm. and I don't know that other relay. And it goes through these, what are called hops. Mm -hmm. And then the information gets the information I'm looking for on a service, and it sends it back to me. O I only know the one in front of me, and the relays only know what's in front of them and behind them. So you can't really trace the traffic. So really, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. And yep. on that peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, you know basically the nodes that you're connected to, but you don't know kind of the greater network of, of who's sending through the nodes you're connected to. And so in some way, uh, Tor is very similar to Bitcoin. In, there's some differences, but there's some similarities as well in like this peer-to-peer -peer network. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you, and they publish which, you know, what the IP address is in there, uh, but you don't know which ones you're connecting to at the time. So, um, you know, it's kind of open like Bitcoin where you can kind of see what the network, what computers are made of the network, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't know which one of those is a certain Onion browser or anything like that, or okay. Onion, Onion service. So when people access the dark web, obviously uh, I'm somewhat joking that like only criminals use it. Uh, there are people who would use it for positive purposes. Maybe let's start there of just like, as you all sat in like the law enforcement seat, like what are reasons why somebody would use it for a, a, uh, a positive way or like not for criminal activity? Sure. Well, it was invented by the U.S. Navy. Um, so the U.S. government, you know, still funds quite a bit of it. Um, it was made for like spies in other countries to talk to other spies and that network couldn't, you couldn't see what they're saying and you didn't know where they were to talk back and forth. Um, and so there are people that use it inside countries that maybe their government controls what they can look at and what they can say and, and talk about. So they, they use it that way. Um, there's people in the United States that use it for privacy. I mean, it certainly is a, is a you know, if, like I said, your ISP knows what traffic you're going to and can look at it. But if you're using Tor, all they know is you're using Tor. That's mm -hmm. it. And when you look at that, like privacy enhancing technology obviously has become much more at the forefront. There's all kinds of things, whether it's around speech, around money, uh, many of the topics we'll talk about today. Um, how do you think about like privacy enhancing technologies being used by good people and people who are nefarious? Like, like it's almost like it's a tool, right? It's kind of like if I give you a shovel, well, if you kill somebody, then you use the shovel to bury it. Like, is the shovel now bad? Like, not really. It's like, you're the bad person. Uh, but also you can use it to dig and build a big building. And like, now you're an amazing person and you make a bunch of money. So like, how do you think about privacy enhancing technology as just one tool that many of these bad organizations, but also good people are using? So, I mean, people always talk about that and they talk about like, like they recently had a conversation about like tornado cash and mm -hmm. how, you know, this anonymous payment system is used. And, and I can come up with an example of why it's really, really bad. I mean, the worst example is, you know, when I was in the FBI, I worked uh, child exploitation cases where parents were renting their children out. Um, You're fucking kidding me. No, it's, it's real. It's really how, how, and this was years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could rent a child out for a certain amount of money and now, if you had an anonymous payment system, it's really difficult for me to track you down. Mm -hmm. uh, put on top of that anonymous, you know, computer communications. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be almost impossible. So I can pull at your heartstring. I know you're a parent. I know you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. going to get you. And you're going to be like, well, fuck this. I'm not going to use this. It's not worth it. It's not See, worth but privacy. I, but I don't, I don't know if I would just go jump to like, uh, we shouldn't have it as much as it, it becomes this like cat and mouse game. And, and I've, I've probably thought about it more than most people, right? In terms of uh, um, there are certain technologies, uh, Bitcoin, but there's also many other technologies that, that uh, people are using today to do things that may not have been possible previously. Peer-to-peer -peer networks in general uh, obviously afford that opportunity. Uh, but what's interesting to me about them is uh, if we go back and look at almost every technology in history that ended up being very valuable, uh, the criminals used it first. Like they were using cell phones and beepers and like all, all this crazy shit that yeah. like now we don't associate a beeper like wow, it's just antiquated. But like when it became the business tool, it wasn't like, oh, that's the drug dealer tool, right? right. But like, there's almost this weird mechanism where like the bad people are trying to get away from guys like you. Right. And, yeah. and so like they're trying to evade law enforcement. They're trying to evade uh, uh, kind of the watchful eye, the surveillance, all the stuff. And so they find these technologies first, but we don't want them to use it for the bad stuff. Like we want it to get mainstream <laughs> adoption and be used for good stuff. So it's like almost like it's a sign that the technology is valuable if the bad people use it first, but then you have to transition to where the majority of people are actually good actors, not the, not the nefarious people. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. And no, I, I agree with you. I'm torn. I'm a technologist. Yeah. I want to see things move forward. I yeah. like new technologies coming out there, but you know, criminals are opportunistic. They're like water. They're going to find the cracks in the mm -hmm. system and they're going to exploit them. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of what's happening. And, and law enforcement is reactionary. We want to be reactionary. Mm -hmm. We don't really want them to be very proactive and, and stop and retard technology. That's the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we want to move forward with it. So I, I feel you. And I, I use that example of the child expectation just to pull it I'm fucking screen. out on that. Yeah, do you, you, <laughs> but, but exactly. Do you yeah. give up privacy because of that? Um, mm -hmm. Because we have the risk of this one thing, mm -hmm. do we give up our, our privacy and do we give mm -hmm. up, you know, moving technology forward? 
I personally don't think so. And I'm a father of two. Yeah. And I, you know, I've seen the images. I've seen what's going on. It's, it's, yeah. it's horrible. Um, you know, we need to put more effort into stopping those people, yeah. but not necessarily stopping that use of technology. How do you guys normally catch those types of people? Like we're going to talk about a bunch of different cases today, but like sure. take, for example, uh, uh, the tri- child predators, things like that. Uh, is it like high tech solutions or is it like, no, these people are just fucking dumb. And like, they literally like leave a receipt somewhere or, you know, like what I would think of as like kind of quote unquote police work. Yeah. That's the low hanging fruit and, and those people are, are, are you know they're caught and, and you know prosecuted um but yeah the, the high-tech stuff is really kind of where it has to go because we want to you know and you want to do a name and shame you want to arrest as many people as you can and you want to get it out there in the news and be like if you're doing this stupid shit we're gonna get you mm-hmm. um you know we're not gonna stop until we've got every last one of you mm-hmm. um it's sort of a whack-a-mole but the harder we're in the more moles we can whack uh mm-hmm. the better for it mm-hmm. so you joined the FBI. Yep. You want to do it your whole life, or what, what, like why? Why join the FBI? Um, so I grew up. Uh, the chief of police lived across the street from me, and I was going to go to school for pre med. Mm-hmm. Um, but he would come home and the badge, the gun, and all that, and I was just really interested in it. And then about my junior year of college, I decided that I didn't really like people. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, so I was, you know, medical school maybe wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked the, I, and I found out what I liked about. It. I liked the investigating. You know, oh, your 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 nose is running. Why is mm-hmm. it running? Let's try to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so the investigative side of me was kind of drawn towards that. So mm-hmm. um, pre-med all through college, uh, junior year, I decided I was going to switch it up. And I said uh, I was I joined the local police department uh, as a campus cadet where I went to college at James Madison University. And it's like a student run organization. And we had a lot of interaction with cops. Uh, and there's a sergeant there named Sid Hartman. Um, and he said, man, computers are the way of the future. Um, so the next day I went up to the computer science department and said, what I got to do to double major. Mm-hmm. Um, and the guy said, get him, get a master's degree. So I stuck around, finished my pre-med, got a master's degree in computer science. And I knew I was going to use that in law enforcement. So yeah. all because Sid Harden told me, uh, that there's the wave of the future. And this was 97, 98. Yeah. <laughs> Could be a pretty good investor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was ahead of time. Huh? So. Um, all right. So, uh, you get the computer science degree. How do you get to the FBI? Um, so I, while I was in computer science, uh, getting my degree, I was a local cop, uh, mm-hmm. got kind of learned that that way, mm-hmm. um, and worked for two different police departments. I was down there uh, in Virginia getting my degree. And then I put in my application and, you know, uh, they brought me on board. Uh, I did computer forensics for the first four years uh, okay. out of Quantico, a fly team out of Quantico. So most people, uh, think of the FBI, they're like, oh, the special agents, they show up, they got the windbreakers on, they're like doing the whole gig, right? Uh, computer forensics is similar to that different than that like what what are the differences i guess between like the computer forensics team and like maybe what people would think of as like what they see the fbi in the movies sure so i was a, a headquarters team and we went and supported all the different cases around the world so we would do a medical fraud case in kansas city um then we'd fly over overseas and do a cell phone of a terrorist going through the through heathrow mm-hmm. or something like that like it was a wide variety of di- like anything involving computer any sort of crime uh we sort of had our fingers in into involved in uh, in doing it so it really kind of it taught me how to investigate cybercrime mm-hmm. by looking at all these different devices and different ways of looking at things. So, like, literally, there's a terrorist going through the airport. Somebody, his name's on a list or something. They stop him. Uh, it's got a computer or a phone or whatever with them. They just hold them there and they call you guys up. You fly over there and, like, you, like, investigate the computer. Like, how does that work? It's a, it's a little bit more uh, secretive than that. Okay. Uh, we might know they're coming in or going in or okay. they don't know they're on some sort of a list. And they might get pulled over into secondary search and their devices are separated from them for a a few moments, uh, that sort of thing. Got it. Uh, Is that common? Uh, The government's very good about that sort of thing, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And and I guess that's like part of that, uh, what are you looking for when you're doing that, right? So like let's say, for example, uh, use the terrorists going through an airport. They don't know they're on a list. They get pulled in a secondary search. They're separated from their phone. You're doing something, whatever. You can tell me what you guys were doing in, you know, six, 70 years ago or not. Um, but what are you looking for? Is it like names and numbers? Is it like a- criminal activity? What, what is it? I'll, I'll be honest with you and okay. I'll tell you exactly what I look for. Okay. Girls Gone Wild videos. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've never looked into a terrorist computer that didn't have a Girls Gone Wild video in You're it. You're joking. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I, I'm not joking. I'm B- saying Bin serious. Laden had porn? <laughs> uh, I didn't look at Bin Laden's computer. Yeah. I did physically see Bin Laden's computers. Uh, oh, really? They were sitting in the office when I walked by one time. I was like, oh, shit, there's a pallet of Bin Laden's computers. Yeah. I thought that was pretty interesting. I, I'm pretty sure there's a book called Bin Laden Papers. Uh, yeah. Or, or, yeah, I think it's called Bin Laden Papers. Uh, and uh, the author went through and translated all the papers, all the stuff and everything, and talks about all the other stuff that was found. And uh, if I remember 
remember correctly, the SEALs who stayed for the extra like 18 minutes or whatever, and they grabbed all the uh, uh, materials and intelligence and stuff. Uh, there's VHS tapes and all this yeah. bullshit, but like there's porn too. Wow. Yeah, I, I've heard that. I heard that yeah. it was in a documentary. But um, but yeah, I mean, for some reason, always, you know, they hate the Western world, but they love the Girls Gone Wild stuff. Yeah, human nature um, takes over. And then it's just intelligence. Uh, it really is you grab as much as you can and it gets digested and crossed uh checked with all, everybody else's uh, data and, yeah. uh, you know, kind of build a picture from there. Yeah. And so, like, a lot of times, is it fair to say that, like, you may not even actually know what you're looking for as much as you're like, we know that we, we believe this person is involved in X, but, like, we're trying to grab as much information as we can. And then we, like, put it together in this puzzle and, like, the puzzle will become clearer as we get more information. Yeah. So, like, yeah. We were just gr we're grabbing as much data as we possibly can and the analysts digest it and kind of put the bubbles together and the lines connecting those bubbles. Do the people or did the people ever understand or realize that this had happened or are they just like, oh, I just got secondary searched and like they move on? I think most didn't. Uh, yeah. And I think most probably brought some sort of uh, dummy phone or, you know, they would bring yeah. a device that they didn't, they knew was clean, If they, especially mm -hmm. if they knew they were on some sort of list. I mean, yep. we did the same when we went to foreign countries. We would bring computers that we intentionally left in hotel rooms, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to see what happened. It's a, it's a cat and mouse game, <laughs> but it's fun. So, all right. So if that happens, like you, you go to a foreign country, you leave the computer there. Uh, I'm assuming there's things on the computer that you want them to discover. Sure. sure yeah. Is this, um, when I was in Iraq, uh, one of the things that they would do is they would find these weapons depots and they would replace uh, some of the explosives with inert explosives. And then they would eventually find it on the battlefield somewhere. And unfortunately, it usually was next to real live IEDs. But then they would be like, okay, cool. We left this here. Now it's here. Like, we can start to map this network. I'm assuming similar type of activity. Similar stuff, yeah. yeah. Or stuff uh, that would beacon home or, or even talk home or, you know, yeah. anything like that. And, there's, um, and, and for those that don't know, uh, this is like – a very well understood, well documented strategy of law enforcement, intelligence organizations, etc. I think you can go all the way back uh, even further than Vietnam. But in Vietnam, there's something called Operation Rising Sun, and what they would do is they would, uh, if I remember correctly, they would find the weapons depots and there would be bullets in there. And then obviously, what are they going to do? Blow up all the bullets or like take them? Like you can't really do much. So they would replace some of the bullets with explosive bu bullets. Wow. And so uh, the Viet Cong would be in the battlefield and they'd be shooting and all of a sudden like your buddy's gun blows up. Like you're like not so excited about shooting your gun now, right? <laughs> and so like there are all of these kind of like psychological games that get played as well. Yeah. Um, when you're doing that stuff, is that like more offensive than defensive? Because I think of a lot of law enforcement as like something happens, we're reacting, we're like almost playing defense. Is the like leave a computer somewhere, is that more offensive type stuff? Uh, yeah, and to gain a little intelligence, you know, mm -hmm. to, to see what happens to the computer and that sort of thing. And, you know, that story, that wasn't the world I was in. But, mm -hmm. you know, if I was in a country and I was asked to do something, I would, you know, simple do it, you yep. know, and then the intelligence would be gathered after that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, that wasn't, my game was more evidence collection and then uh, once I, you know, law enforcement, the, the reactionary stuff. Yeah. So when do you first hear about Bitcoin? Bitcoin was brought to me by uh, a guy named Ilwan Yum. He was an agent on my squad. So the, in the government, there's a thing called use or lose. Okay. Um, so uh, if you don't, you get vacation time. If you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, and so from, again, not a roadmap of when to commit crime. Yeah. Um, from Thanksgiving to New Year's, all the senior agents are gone. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it's time to catch up on your paperwork, do whatever you got to do. Um, and so Christmas time of, I guess it was... 2010, Ilwan came into the squad and said, hey, we got this thing. Um, it's me, him, and a guy named Tom Kiernan, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, he's the computer scientist on the squad. We're sitting around, and he's, like, explaining to us what this is. And so we set up a computer in the back, and we started mining. I said, let's, let's learn about it. Let's what's going on. So, okay, this is fascinating to me because 2010, Christmas 2010 is, what, two years, give or take, since the launch, January 3rd, 2009. Uh, at this point, uh, I believe it is now listed on exchanges. Uh, there is a there is like a price to it, uh, but it's still very few people in the world know what it is. Like it's basically the white paper is like the only marketing do, uh, thing that's out there. Do we know how he found out about it? I don't. I mean, I'm in very close contact with Ilan, yeah. uh, so I could find out, but I don't remember. He just came in. He was always ahead of this sort of thing. Like yeah. He was just kind of reading up on things, and he'd be on forums and all that sort of stuff. Anything new technology, Ilan was the guy to go to. So it's interesting because it – a lot of technologies come top down, like they go, you know, uh, nation state, corporations, then the individual. You can think of the Internet, right, yeah. as you mentioned, and, and even dark web stuff, whatever. This was so bottoms up, right? right? And so, like, literally the place to learn about it was not like go look at the government budget, what they're investing in. It was like go to the forum that, like, nobody knows about. Yeah. And so it, as you guys get there, 
uh, and you start to learn about it. You're like, let's go start mining. Did you do this every time you guys heard about new technology? You're like, oh, let's go try it. Or like, what what made you want to go mine versus do something else? Well, we had one. We had nothing else to do because no one was around. Uh, the boss wasn't around or anything like that. Um, it was I, like I said, I'm a technologist. I'm always interested in these new things. So yeah, we were involved in in any sort of thing like that. I mean, if we weren't having a land party in the back, you know, shooting each other, um, you know, we were you know trying these new things that are out there, and, and you know, we like to stay on top of it and knowledgeable mm -hmm. about it because you know it would come up and you don't want to look like you know there's a lot of around probably a little after that there was a lot of senior agents that were kind of coming on and like oh i'm going to join cyber the last three years so i can get a job um and that you know kind so of so when they left they would then get a job because they could say they were in the cyber unit yeah you know because it's kind of funny when you're in uh, we're in the academy uh, and i know i'm jumping back and forth no, all no, over here um when you're in the academy you kind of like you're put into your specialties you know you got your criminal guys your intelligence guys and your counterterrorism guys you know those are the you know, that's what you want to do the counterterrorism and you got your cyber dorks mm -hmm. uh my class there was like six of us mm -hmm. and you know they kind of made fun of us they're the computer guys and all that mm -hmm. and that sort of thing i was like you know the computer guys are going to have a job skill at one point you might yeah. want to think about. It. And so it took the agents a little ways to their career to realize like, mm -hmm. oh, shit, there's no counterterrorism after I get out of the bureau. Yeah. What am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to join a computer squad and kind of get that. What is the culture inside the FBI in you left 2014 or so? Yeah. Um, like I think of law enforcement the same I would think of the military, the same I would think of like a sports locker room or whatever, right, where there's like a lot of kind of like shit talking each other, but it's done in like a friendly way. And, and it's um, uh, got a very specific type of culture that like usually wouldn't be allowed in like a normal company, but sure. it's this like different type of organization. Is that similar to how the FBI? It was my experience. Operated. I mean, it's, it's a brotherhood. I mean, I was in the New York office for the last six years of my career. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're just put on a specialized squad. So our whole squad is computers where I had classmates, you know, their first day out of the academy, they're on a SWAT team, you know, and, and that's what Jesus. they did because, you know, the, the senior guys didn't want to do it. So yeah. it, it really is what field office you go to. New York's the biggest field office. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, there's a, there's called RAs, uh, resident agencies, a smaller satellite office to the office. Mm -hmm. The Brooklyn RA would be the fifth largest FBI office. Uh, and that's just a satellite office off of New York. So that's just to give the sense of how big the New York office is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of crazy, right? Like, do we know how many agents work at the FBI now? When oh, I, I want to say like fourteen thousand somewhere around okay. there, maybe between like eleven five and fourteen or fifteen thousand, um, just to put that you know NYPD has over forty thousand cops, and that's yeah. just one city law you know law enforcement. It, it, it's interesting because you have like okay, let's say it's fourteen fifteen thousand FBI, then you've got you said forty thousand for uh, NYPD, yeah. then you've got like just the IRS like new influx is gonna be eighty seven thousand, yeah. right? Like you start to like put these numbers in, and and in some ways fourteen thousand is a lot to some people, but fourteen thousand is also not a lot if you're like essentially monitoring the globe yeah and right? then we're spread across the globe I and mean, there's fbi agents all over the all over the world i mean there's what is the fbi's mission like is it more domestic focused international it's everything like how, how did you guys inside of the organization think about like we're here to do x so i was a criminal investigator so mine was criminal cyber my entire life mm -hmm. uh, and that's so i worked just on that. The, the house is split. There's an intelligence side you know mm -hmm. counterterrorism intelligence side, and there's a, the criminal side mm -hmm. um we know about those guys and yeah. we knew who they were and all that. But <laughs> See them in the hallway. <laughs> yeah, we didn't really, well, not really because they're in skiffs and all that. Those yeah. guys, those guys live in a world where their cell phone has to go into a box before they go to their desk. Um, so everyone was always like, oh, they, you know, I'll hear from them eight hours from now when they finally leave, you know, or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. So it was a different world. Yeah. Um, it's kind of crazy. Um, all right. So you guys start mining Bitcoin. Yep. Uh, are you mining a lot, a little? Like, is it just like one computer? Are you like, oh shit, let's become billionaires? <laughs> no, I mean, no. I mean, I mean, we were talking about pennies on the dollar back then, you know. Yeah. Uh, maybe, you know, it was a dime, maybe it was worth, maybe. I don't even think there was that high. Um, I don't even know where those Bitcoins are. They're on some hard drive sitting on a shelf somewhere. Uh, it's probably on the 22nd floor in New York office somewhere, <laughs> I'm sure. So what you're saying is the FBI owns Bitcoin. <laughs> yes, 100%. There's Bitcoin sitting on a hard drive somewhere. Unless, unless someone wiped it, which I can't imagine they would wipe that computer. Yeah, uh, I, I've said this before. Uh, there's somebody I know who worked at the DEA, yeah. and uh, he told me that the first time he ever saw kind of the intersection of uh, Bitcoin and law enforcement was they were mining but uh the way he told the story is like they had put in budget requests to go try to purchase bitcoin so that they then could try to use it in uh investigations but everyone's like what the fuck's bitcoin like this is crazy whatever so then they just put in a budget request for computers and they're like yeah yeah sure you guys need computers whatever and they were using that to mine and then obviously it wasn't kyc like all this stuff now i don't know how true it is or, or not uh but it is fascinating where you guys were like doing it from like an intellectual exercise did that drive you more and more to like start thinking about crime 
in the Bitcoin world or like at the time, was there no even thought process like people probably committing crime? It's just like literally this is a computer science, like interesting exercise. Let's go learn about it. No, it was an old shit moment yeah. because we're, you know, in cybercrime, there's two different ways of, of going at it. There's tracking the IP addresses and there's tracking the money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, PayPal stuff or anything online that was mm -hmm. kind of bank accounts and all that. And this was an, oh, shit, we can't track this. This is going to be a problem. Um, so and it is like right out of the gate. You guys knew this is going to be a challenge. Yeah, I think sitting around Tom Ilwan and I sitting around, it was like, you know, this is this is going to be an issue. And then finally, when the New Year's came in, we started talking to the senior guys. They, they were like, yeah, I can see where this is going to be a problem. Yeah. OK, <laughs> so uh, it's fascinating that like right away you guys are like, oh, shit. Right. Yeah. Um, now, we didn't see where it was going. I mean, the rise of crypto is, is the reason for ransomware. Yep. Uh, I mean, all, all that stuff, all this crazy online stuff is is because of the rise of crypto. OK, so we're going to talk about that yeah, in a second. Right. This episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Good sleep is a game changer and the Eight Sleep pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8 Sleep Pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an 8 Sleep. You can go to 8sleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life, and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an 8sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. Uh, when you start out looking at, okay, this is going to be a difficult force, whatever, talk a little bit about the relationship between, like, these federal law enforcement agencies and the payment companies. Like, is it, uh, okay, we think this person's a bad person, let's go to, like, a, a FISA court or something, get an order, then they give us the information. Like, like how does that relationship work uh, in, like, the most general sense. I know there's tons sure. of outliers, sure. but like, like how, I guess maybe how is it supposed to work? FISA court's the other side of the house. We okay. didn't do that. Criminal side, we're doing with the grand jury. What is the FISA court? Uh, it's a court of regular judges who do a cycle and they hear the national security cases, the Got stuff okay. that can't be public and made. Uh, we do grand jury subpoenas and search warrants okay. on our side of the house. And so it's like not national security things and these are like public hearings? Like could somebody just like go to a New York courthouse and like listen to you say, hey, I need this person's payment information? Nope, that's a grand jury. It's secret information. It falls under 6E. Okay. Um, so there's a secret grand jury. And in, in some jurisdictions, not in New York, in some jurisdictions, the agent actually goes before the grand jury, 18 people, and says, I need this person's, this account's uh, payment information. Or uh, th Think about a subpoena as like, as like a letter. Mm -hmm. um, if I send you a letter, all a subpoena gets me is what's on the outside of the envelope. Mm -hmm. To, from, the date it was sent, and all that sort of thing. If I want to see inside, I need a search warrant. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with payment information. I'd get your name, your bank account number, and stuff like that, but I, I wouldn't see your transactions. I need a search warrant for that information. Okay. Uh, so I'd go to, sorry, finish. I'd go to the grand jury, and I'd say, I need this information. They might ask why, and I'd tell them why. Uh, and then I would take that subpoena that they issue. It's their authority and send it to the payment Whatever. people, the, the information would come back and then I'd have to tell them what the answer was. This is what I got back from them. Got it. Okay. Uh, when you go before the secret grand jury or grand jury, I guess, um, did they ever say no? Uh, sure. Sure. But what, uh, more the cutoff line is, uh, this is my experience in New York. Yeah. Again, it, it's more- It's you different go, everywhere. Yeah, it's a different everywhere. All <laughs> the trolls, calm down. <laughs> yeah. We're caveating everything. <laughs> go <you>. ahead. <laughs> It's more the AUSA. You go to the AUSA and they go to the grand, they, they send some paperwork to the grand jury and the paper, it comes back. No one actually goes. Out in Oklahoma, I know my boss was out in Oklahoma City. He'd actually have to go. Okay. I never had that experience. In New York, you send it over to the AUSA. And, and a few times, even the AUSA is like, we can't do that. What the hell are you asking for? We had, there was a hacking group uh, in 2000. 11, 2012, and there were kids that were like doxing and um, bomb threats and all that sort of thing. And we found out one kid went to a high school in uh, Richmond, Virginia. How did you find that out? Um, stuff online. We figured out who he was, you know, Twitter posts and stuff like that. We kind of figured out, but all we knew his name was Mike, and he went to a high school in, uh, so you in guys Richmond. Are kind of like, I mean, not to uh, uh, water down the work that's going into this, but like, there's a lot of people who like, meet a girl or a guy at a bar and like go do cyber stalking. Like to some degree, like that's a little bit of the work to at least kind of get the ball rolling to try to understand like who is this person, where do they go to school or whatever. And then you like go start doing like actual law enforcement work. We're really good at it. Yeah. If you want to cyber stalk your girlfriend, we're, we're really good at it. <laughs> that scares the shit out of me, but okay. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, on the don't meet Chris at a bar. <laughs> no, well, I'm married though. So thank God. Um, so, I mean, the, the good thing about it, uh, not I'll go off on a tangent yeah. is, uh, you know, that, 
I used to have to get a search warrant to look in your house. Yeah. Now I just go look on your Facebook or your kid's Facebook page. He's got mm-hmm. pictures all inside your house, and I can see exactly what's sitting around and those sort of things. So people kind of gave up privacy a little yeah, bit with it, that. Yeah, it does. And, and, like, what's interesting about this um, – is it, it's not lost to me, right? There's a lot of people who I think are like, oh, okay, cool. What these guys are all doing is uh, is important and stopping, you know, whether it's national security stuff or yeah. crime or like whatever. There's a bunch of people who are like, fuck these guys, like they're horrible people, right? And so like, uh, I tend to think that like on the extreme ends, usually the truth is like somewhere in between, yeah. right? And what you're basically saying is like, listen, uh, there are people who are doing things for convenience or for entertainment or for whatever, but it also is a trade off with privacy, which like I think now people are waking up to the fact like, yeah, if you go and you post a bunch of photos on the internet and it's a public profile, like anyone can go look at it, like you should probably be careful what you post on the internet. And it's there forever. You can take it down if you want, but it's not really down. Mm -hmm. Someone captured it and brought it in. Mm -hmm. And so that's like the first step, I'm guessing. Sure, yeah, online intelligence. Hey, let's go just Google around and try to figure out what we can find on this person and then we'll go from there. Yeah, powerful tool, Google. But (laughs) so back to the subpoena though. So the, when kind of the the stops on us. So we knew it was Mike or his name is, I think it was Mike, I might just be making that up. But we uh, send him, we send a a subpoena request over to the AOC and say, we need all the mics that go to a high school in any, in Richmond or any of the surrounding counties. And the AOC is like, there's no fucking way. You're not, we're, we're not doing that. And so there really? is a check and balance. So it was like, cause it was a hot case. I mean, the director was involved because the director's daughter had been part of uh, their attack. And these guys went after, after her. Oh, so they were like fucking with the FBI. They were fucking with everybody. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it took a, a personal route at us at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it, you know, there is a check and balance there where we're not, we're not even going to go to the grand jury with that request. You're crazy. Yeah. It's a high school kid. You're talking about school records, yep. you know, but we took a shot, you know, we, yeah. we, we, were at a, we, were, we couldn't get any further with the case and this is what we needed, but we cracked it anyways. Okay. So in those types of scenarios, uh, I don't know all the details of it, sure. but I'm going to say that that's like uh, uh, high school menaces using online tools. If, if what they're doing is they're harassing people, you're being a menace. It's bad. You shouldn't do it. Like go after it. If it's bomb threats, now you've kind of like crossed over into another thing. If you're actually like inciting or committing violence, you like kind of ratchet up more and more the uh the severity i think and the importance probably yeah how do you delineate where to actually put the resources so you guys are sitting there there's a million things that you could go do is it like the director or somebody is just like okay this team you're gonna go do work on this now or are you all sitting there saying like we have six different cases that we could go look at let's do kind of like a risk reward type analysis and then like go spend six months working on a case it doesn't really the director doesn't get involved in that sort of thing i mean unless it's a you know obviously if the director's family somehow involved it kind of you know trickles down people are paying attention but it's more i mean that sort of decision making is more on the like the supervisor of the squad on on where the resources are at the right place and that's normally a guy that's been on for at least seven years Mm -hmm. uh hopefully he worked on that squad or worked that uh, offense before so he kind of knows where the resources to go in in this case we were talking about just a second ago with the the kid they were involved in swatting they kind of brought swatting to the forefront where we were starting to see some some real negative outcomes to you know Mm -hmm. sad yeah swat teams to people's houses and and so i I think as you kind of look at this that is, you know, there's like bomb threats or swatting, like you kind of ratchet up there. How much of like the cyber crimes that you guys were dealing with would be on the like, there's potential violence involved, right? Versus like, there's like buying drugs. There's like still things that are are criminal activity, but like, it's not violent crime. Is there like a percentage that you could look at is, I don't know how how long you were in the FBI, like 10 years or whatever, but like, what percent was actually like violent stuff versus like when people think of online, I think a lot of times they think of like, oh, there's no violence to this. It's just like playing around in the digital world. Um, I think actual people dying or, you know, very low. Mm-hmm. Um, and we say, we say that once in a while, but like, you know, we get the call in the, in the middle of the night on a Saturday night after, you know, a night out, be like, did anybody die? Mm-hmm. I mean, do I really have to come in? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's kind of just like one of those, those check things, but, but you know, everything has a potential. I mean, Silk Road has reported deaths, to mm-hmm. it and murders to it. Um, again, we, people renting out their children. Um, mm-hmm. As a father, to me, that's yeah, almost shit. almost as bad as death. Um, okay, so you guys, uh, you know about Bitcoin. You're mining Bitcoin now. Yep. How do we get from that to like uh, Silk Road? So in the middle there, there was a case called Lulsec, mm-hmm. um, which is a group of hackers that were kind of part of Anonymous. Um, and we ended up finding the leader of uh, Lulsec, a guy named Hector Monsegor, Sabu at the time, sort of, we call him the, sort of the Kaiser Sose of hacking around then. Um, and Why, Why'd you call him that? <laughs> Uh, it was a good way. So you have to tell people what's going on. And so, mm-hmm. you know, he kind of was like this 
guy that was mystical on the internet and people feared him. Other hackers feared him. They're like, Why? Oh. Um, because he would just get you. Uh, the worst thing that happened to a hacker, I think, is being doxxed. Um, and, you know, the real identity putting out there. And people just didn't want to screw with, with Sabu. Sabu had some, you know, there's a lot of people that front that they hack on the internet. Yep. There's very few that actually do it. Yeah. Um, you but know. he was good. He was good. And he, you know, he put his name out there. There's a lot of hackers that are good that just don't put, say anything. Yeah. They just do it and go about their work. So he kind of, he branded himself. He branded himself as this, this, you don't, you don't fuck with me type guy. Got it. Uh, and why did you guys start to go after them? Were they doing similar type of stuff or? or um, Lolsec was, had their, so. Anonymous had this thing around WikiLeaks mm -hmm. uh, with PayPal and MasterCard and started hacking into stuff and getting in the news. Um, then Lulsec started having their 50 Days of Terror. They didn't leave the 50 Days of Terror at the time. They didn't know it yet. Um, but then they went after a, really what got our attention is they went after a, an FBI affiliated site, a place called InfraGuard. So, and then they started having a thing called uh, FFF or Fuck FBI Friday. So they were, they were swinging at the FBI every Friday in law enforcement. Um, that's going to raise our attention. Okay, hold on. Back up, back up, <laughs> yeah. back up, back up, back up. Uh, and, and I'll caveat this entire conversation with, like, I know enough to be dangerous, but, like, I'm definitely not an expert in any of this, so if I screw up, correct me. Sure. Um, so they start out, is it the equivalent of like kind of petty crime and then they start to like sophisticate over time and then it kind of builds and builds and builds and then almost to some degree it sounds like you begin to like get comp, you're like almost like looking for the attention where you're like, what can we, what can we do to just go bigger and bigger every time? Is that like generally how these groups work? Yeah, I got away with it. Now, how it, you know they were in the news every day. I mean, they they, okay. they you know they were putting out these big hacks and you know being they had five hundred thousand followers on Twitter. I mean, this was a hacking crew. This was a criminal yeah. organization that had fans. Yeah. Well, at the time, Twitter wasn't that big. I mean, that was yeah. a lot of followers back then. So when this may be hard to do, but sure. take yourself out of your seat and put it in their seat. What are they trying to accomplish at the time? Like, what was your understanding of what they were trying to accomplish, or was it just like cause chaos? Lulls. I mean, it was it really yeah. their motto was for the lulls. They were doing it because it was funny to fuck with you. Yeah. Like they could have, I mean, they could have shorted stuff. They could have short, you know, they could have, before they hacked into a major business, they could have shorted it and made a shitload of money. Yeah. The SEC is probably going to find that pretty quickly. And then, you know, those transactions, then you're tracing the money, which is pretty easy. Yeah. Um, so so maybe they were smart to not do it that way. So in some way, it's almost like uh, it's harder to catch somebody who isn't trying to make money off of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because so like it, it, I lose that path, that, that financial two, cybercrime, two paths, money's an IP. Yeah. Uh, if I, if money's not involved, then I only have one path I can follow. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Okay. So, uh, so they start going, now you said FFF, yeah. fuck FBI Friday. Yep. What are they doing on fuck FBI Friday? Every Friday they would dump something that somehow tangentially, uh, attributed to the FBI or some sort of law enforcement stuff. Um, so they're trying to embarrass the FBI. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And they, there was a hacker that came in, the guy going by the name of Anar Chaos, who like, that was his sole mission was just to fuck with cops, just hated cops and would dump anything. I mean, and dump means like he somehow hacked something, got records and then like just puts it out on the dark web and anyone can look at it or what exactly does dump mean? Yeah. I mean, so puts it out anywhere. I mean, whereas Lulsec was dumping it every on just, uh, social media, wherever they could, mm -hmm. um, they, they weren't hiding anything. So uh, they just want as much, they want as many eyeballs on this information as possible. Yeah. It's po police information, stuff they would use, uh, police tactics, sources within the police, anything that was, you know, behind that, that wall of secrecy for the law enforcement. Okay. So, uh, I'm coming at this from my only experience really with law enforcement like communities, et cetera, is the military, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of shit that's been leaked from the military that if you were directly involved with it, you're like, fuck this, this is bad. Like, you know, you guys shouldn't do that, whatever. There's other things that get leaked from the military that I think people in the military are like, eh, military shouldn't have been doing that, <laughs> right? Like like kind of sure. almost like a, hey, I don't like the fact that somebody went and hacked it and, and released it, but like, by the way, like it's, it may be on, is a net positive over the long run because somebody did do that. How do you evaluate the stuff that they were doing? Is it like all like really dumb shit and it's just like, oh, they were just fucking with us and like there was nothing really there? Or are there things that like in hindsight, you're like, okay, these guys shouldn't have been doing this. It was wrong. They broke the law, blah, blah, whatever. We went and caught them. But like the information was actually like pretty explosive stuff. Like how uh, should we rate it? I don't get to rate it. I don't get to judge yeah. it. Okay. You know, it's, you know, it's a violation of 18 USC 1030. Yep. Uh, you know, and the fact and, and that you have that memorized means you really were fucking focused on this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what, that's my life. So, yeah. I mean, I had to go after it. I mean, that, yeah. I didn't get to pick and choose. I no, mean, no, I'm, I'm not saying at the time. Yeah. I, I, I mean, more oh, so like uh, the, the, the severity of what they're leaking. Sure. Is this like 
holy shit, uh, they're trying to like claim the FBI is corrupt? Or is it like, uh, oh, look at these guys we like released who their, uh, I don't know, who their uh, um, uh, people feeding them information is and like we're just trying to embarrass them? Uh, it was more on the embarrassing side. Some yeah. companies didn't. I mean, they had some information that they mm-hmm. definitely didn't want to put out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, look at the severity. So Hector Monsiger was arrested here in the United States. He was facing 125 years in prison. That's uh, a lot. His uh, two other guys that were also part of LulzSec, they were uh, over in Ireland. They were slapped on their wrist and sent back to college. Um, so same crimes, Does same things. Does that speak more to what they were doing or more to the different justice systems? Different justice systems. So, okay. I mean, it's it, it probably That's somewhere in the middle. Yeah, that, yeah. Th- well, hold on. <laughs> Just repeat that again. That, that, what? So three guys, same group, doing the same shit. Six guys total. Six guys. Yep. The guy that gets arrested in the United States, American citizen? Yep. And you are you guys friends with we are very close friends now. We actually have a podcast together. Okay, so. all right. <laughs> so, yeah, no. Yeah. I, I, I arrested one of my closest friends. Can, it's can a I, very strange relationship. Can, can I give you uh, my reaction? So for, the, for those that don't know how uh, some of these podcasts come together, somebody emailed me and was like, hey, there's this guy. He's really fascinating. Like, you should talk to him. And I was like, who the fuck's this guy? Like, Google, do, 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 right? And then all of a sudden on the same email, somebody's like, hey, by the way, the guy he arrested also wants to come on. And I was like, do I need security for that? <laughs> like, like, wait, wait. And so I went down and I was like, this is fucking crazy. Yeah. So the guy, Hector, who yep. gets arrested here in the United States, he's an American citizen yes. at the time. Okay. He still is an American citizen. <laughs> okay. He gets faced with 125 years yep. in prison, but the guys in Ireland who get arrested, who I guess are not American citizens. Nope. They were Irish citizens. They just go back to high school or uh, they college, were in college or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, they, there's a slight crazy. penalty and yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah, but, but that's but, crazy. But it is. But well, I mean, we made a deal that they were charged in the United States, but their arrest warrants are sitting in a file somewhere. We didn't file like a red notice or anything that mm-hmm. if they traveled, they'd be extradited. Why over did here. you guys not do that? Uh, that was a deal with a bunch of the prosecutors. So the Irish prosecutors came over to New York. And we sat down and we talked about it and all that. And it was it, politically, it worked out some way that way. And there Got was it. a bunch so of There's a lot of paper. negotiating and things that people may not understand that kind of happen in these cases, especially when they're multi jurisdictional or, or multi country or whatever. Sure. Yeah. And I think, I mean, a lot of it was that, you know, we had Hector and Hector and I sat by side, sat by side by side for like eight months working on cybercrime. So Hector, leader of Anonymous, leader of LulzSec, rested him, flipped him to work with the FBI. So we sat What's there. What's that like? Flipping him? Yeah. Are you just walking in and you're like, yo, bro, you work for us now? Like, no. let's get to work? No. Or is, or is he like, literally you arrest someone? He's like, I fucking hate you guys. Uh, I mean, he was true to spirit. We sat at his kitchen. He, you know, he let us in his house. So he didn't have to. Um, we sat at his kitchen table. Because you guys showed up to arrest him. Yeah, we showed up to arrest him. Okay. There was a surveillance team that was watching him all day. And then someone had doxed him uh, that night. And so we, Ooh, hold on, we roll out. Hold yeah. on. So <laughs> <laughs> the doxing usually happens before the surveillance team. But there was a surveillance team who you guys already knew who he was or thought you knew who he was? Yep, yeah. We had pretty, well, we obviously we knew who he was because uh, yeah. well, was Well, you knew right who guy. he was, but you thought it was the person, Sabu or whatever. Yeah, um, we, we knew Sabu. I mean, we knew that Sabu was Hector Monsignor. Okay. And we put a surveillance team on him to watch what was going on. And, okay. Why, why, when you make that connection, do you not just go arrest immediately? Uh, building the case. I mean, we had to, you know, get all the information. We okay. still had search warrants coming back from different accounts and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. So we wanted to make sure we had it, you know, dead to rights. And when you have a search warrant, uh, this is like super nuanced stuff, uh, okay. and you go and let's say you get bank account information, like does the bank tell the person? Nope. So you kind of crazy. You, you file it under seal. Mm-hmm. So once the case all comes out, then the judge lifts that seal. So Got it. And you file see. You, when you when you ask for the search warrant, you also ask the judge to make an order of it for under seal. So because it's an ongoing investigation. Okay. So uh, surveillance teams watching this guy. You guys already know it, who who he is. Um, I'll tell okay. you in cybercrime, and we'll probably talk about it with the Ross Albrecht arrest. Yeah. You're never positive. I mean, it's still, well, you have all this information and all that, but it could be wrong. I mean, they're very good at obfuscating their, their identities. I mean, um, you know, cases where they like make you think there's somebody else and then you guys go and you're like, oh shit, this isn't the right person. Um, yeah, we've had that. We've definitely had that where we, we, you know, uh, I didn't. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But someone on my squad, certainly we, we tracked somebody and went to their work, was looking, you know, watching them and all that. And, And like, like we had a surveillance team on them. We had night vision on them and all that. And like messages were going up on Twitter and all like, and they're like, well, maybe he had his phone in his pocket and he could do all this. And we're like, then this is an agent holding on strong that she has the right guy. We're like, 
There's no way he tweeted a coherent message with his hand in his pocket looking forward. We're watching on the video as the tweet comes out. And like, come on. You know, so, so sometimes like, you hold a little strong. But it's, but it's like pretty sophisticated. I mean, if you're literally like trying to match like, hey, we're live watching and there's a tweet, like you start to like really do this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. That, so I'm sure we're gonna, that's the whole Ross thing. So putting Ross as DPR was was a big deal. Okay. So uh, if we go back to Hector yep. and, and uh, uh, Sabu. Sab- Sabu was his online name. Okay. Uh, you have the surveillance team there. He gets doxxed. Very interesting that the surveillance team's there and there's a doxing. You're smiling. So, like, are you guys doxing him? No, definitely no, not okay. because we right. wanted to build the case. No, that, okay. that's where it's our old shit moment. Uh, I was sitting around in, like, a, a T-shirt and shorts, mm-hmm. uh, and we have to go, you know, the, my boss wasn't there, and his boss wasn't uh, there. It was, like, late, like, 6 o'clock on a Thursday night or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so, like, somebody else, like, finally got Sabu. Yeah, we know right? who it is. Okay, so somebody, somebody gets him, and they dox him, and then you guys— But they never know it's real. Like, oh, they're just putting the information out there. Like, he was doxxed as 20 different people. Got it, got it. This got it, person got it, got just it. happened to get it right when we were watching. Okay. <laughs> and so you guys move because you're scared he's going to, like, run or, like, get do the, something? Yeah, get the hell out of there. Got it, okay. Destroy evidence, do whatever he's going to do to get, get the hell out of there. So, like, uh, sorry if this is too detail-oriented, but do you just, like— Go knock on his door. Yeah, that's exactly what we did. <laughs> so, uh, okay, <laughs> we we run out again. I'm in shorts and a t shirt, and I have my bulletproof oh, but vest. This, but this is like a oh shit, like we got to get there quick. We're this going. Is not, we're yeah, going. Yeah, okay, my right. boss's boss went. He stopped by NYPD to get us the sledgehammer and a ballistic shield because we didn't have any of this stuff ready. Oh, this is like game. This is like real game on. Yeah, we didn't. You know, yeah. Because you because you guys think that uh, when I hear sledgehammer and ballistic shield, like. You're not going because you think he's going to offer you pastries at the fucking front door. Is it? Do you, you think that these people are armed, or it's just like, no, this is all precaution. Like we you do always this go every prepared. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. every time you go prepared. But normally we have a plan. It's six a.m. Yep. We're going to go in. You know, we have everything mapped out. We're going to know which way the door opens. We're going to know does the door in or out. I mean, we practice all this stuff before we go and do an arrest. Okay. You go knock on the door, and you said he invites you in. Well, he opened the door a crack, and when you open a crack, you learn from being a street cop, you kind of put your foot there, so the door maybe is not going all the way back closed. Yep. Um, and, you know, he comes out in the hallway and starts talking to us, and we convince him, maybe you don't want to talk, your neighbors hear, hear what's going on, you're, you know, you're, or he lived in a neighborhood that you really didn't want to see him talking to law enforcement openly. Got it. So maybe we want to make this more private and remind him of that. Got it. And so uh, then he invites you in after you have reminded him of that detail. Uh, Are you guys like, where's your computer? Or like what, like just walk me through like what happened. So we sit down at his kitchen table and we sit there and talk and it's me and another agent. Um, And there's like, Six agents out in the hall, uh, ballistic shields, vests, and all that. They're just standing out there. They're around the corner, so it looks a little strange. Um, and we said, you know, yeah, where's the computer? And he goes, I don't have a computer. And I look over to the left, and there's a power cord uh, that sticks out, you know, a laptop power cord. There's a flashing modem up on the shelf and all that. So I let him just keep talking and talking and talking. Finally, I, I point this out to him. I said, I said, you know. There's these two things. Don't fuck with me. Where are they? You know, and he's like, eh, okay, there's a laptop somewhere. Uh, uh, I threw it out the window. We're on the sixth floor. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, so we just keep talking and talking. It, it was it was, took about two hours till he finally said that I am Sabu. Um, it really? Took, yeah. It took him that while. So start off with I don't have a computer until yeah. I threw it out the window. Did he actually throw it out the window? No, nah, I was hidden in one of the bedrooms. Okay. <laughs> uh, when you finally get him to say the computer's there, not out the window, um, do you just like, are you like log in? Um, no, no, we, you know, you kind of, once that relief of the identity and the lies you've been holding people yeah. kind of like, it's like, <sighs> yeah, they just want to talk and you just sit there and listen. You don't, you don't. Did he them. admit to everything? Uh, not everything. He thought he could social engineer us and kind of pick and choose what it, mm-hmm. and that, that's a multi-day process of going through mm-hmm. what he's going to protect and not protect. We just had a conversation the other day and he told me about something he always protected and never told me. Oh, uh, so he's still, yeah, he's still, still got still, stuff. But not really like crimes because he, yeah. he admitted all his crimes. So you have, well, once he decided to work with the FBI, you have, like, it's called Princess for a Day. Um, you literally say every Princess crime. Princess for a Day. Yeah, you literally talk about every crime. This one day I sped on the highway and I did 58 miles an hour. Okay, they write that down. You're exonerated of all of it. You're charged with all of it. So they charge you with every crime you ever did. And if you mentioned it in that part of the deal, then the government can't go back and charge you again for it. Really? So you literally sit there and you talk about everything. I don't know how I feel about that. Why? <laughs> Like the speeding, all that type of stuff, right? It's like uh, well, that's okay. a federal crime. Yeah, I say that of as course, a joke, yeah, of course, right? But like, uh, let's just say like the small stuff. It's like uh, 
that is unrelated to the case, I almost feel like when you flip them, but again, my uneducated view from the outside would be like, oh, we are going to exonerate you for things related to this crime. But like, I guess people who would commit some of these crimes also did a bunch of other stuff too. And so like maybe in some way you're trying to like build confidence in them. They're like, hey, you work with us now or? Got to make them a clean witness. Because now if you're working with the FBI, you're going to become a witness to crimes. Okay. And so you don't want them to be on the stand testifying against somebody else. And the defense says, well, you did this, this, and this. And, the, you know, oh shit moment for the government. Yeah. You come clean to everything you do. You get charged with it. And that goes all into the report of, you know, uh, fast forward. I'll fast forward to the end of it. You yeah. know, he, 125 years for everything he came clean to. The judge thanked him for his service as he and he walked out of court that day at his sentencing. So. So what is the deal that he streak that he strikes? Um, that and who he, proposes the deal? Do you guys propose the deal or is he like, I'll work for you? We propose the deal. Okay. Like he, uh, when you're arrested, you don't you don't have any idea how the FBI works. I mean, yeah. it's all, you, you know, it's flashes and lights and mirrors yeah, yeah. and you know you don't know what's going You're on probably hoping you just go take a nap <laughs> yeah um you know the deal was work with us and so normally think about like um the mafia mm -hmm. uh i'm gonna arrest a street level guy i'm gonna work up to the underboss and then get arrest the yep. big guy we had the big guy i mean literally we had the head of Olsec, the, the head guy so what the fuck are we gonna do with him mm -hmm. we didn't really know what was going on in the hacking world at the time yeah so is he excited about this like now that he's like okay fuck they caught me like is he just – I almost think of it as like uh, – um, I was listening to a podcast recently to talk about Kobe Bryant and uh, Michael Jordan. And they love basketball so much that Michael Jordan uh, uh, forced the Chicago Bulls to put in his contract something called the love of the game clause, which meant that uh, usually in these NBA contracts, you're not allowed to play basketball outside of NBA sanctioned sure. things because they don't want you to get hurt or whatever. And he's like, no, literally if I'm driving down the street and I see a basketball game, I want to be able to go play. <laughs> and they were like, uh, okay, you're Michael Jordan. Yeah. Like, sure. Yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that there's some hackers who are like, I just like hacking, like almost like I'll switch teams back and forth and I just enjoy it. Like it's almost like the love of the game. Or was it like, no shit, I'm going to go to jail for 125 years. And like, I better fucking go work for these guys. I mean, so, and he was also a foster parent to two of his uh, nieces. Okay. So that, you know, yeah. Didn't use that against him. Yes. But it's a mitigating factor in his mind of yep. uh, what was happening in his life. And, you know, my thing is, you know, you're going to go to jail tonight. We're going to go upstairs. We're going to process you and you're going to go over MCC. MCC is not a nice place, mm -hmm. um, you know, or you can work with us and you're going to be back home tonight. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we took him in the middle of the night. We brought him in the morning and we had him there in time to bring the, his girls to, uh, to school the next day. Wow. Yeah. All right. So uh, he doesn't get 125 years. Nope. What do you guys start doing together first? Everything. He's Sabu. People <laughs> sent him. I mean, people, he didn't have to hack. People were just sending hacks. We this had, dude was literally like the fucking Babe Ruth of hacking. Um, if people were scared of Babe Ruth. Okay. So people wanted to be near him. People wanted to just associate with him, be like, like almost kiss the ring sometimes. It felt a little weird, to be honest. So it's more like John Gotti. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the fear. That's, a, that's a, I've never put it that way, but that's a perfect thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and they would bring him hacks. Be like, hey, I broke into these military institutes. Here, the, these things are hacked into. He had 306 military say I call them saves. Uh, you know, things that were broken into in the U.S. military that we stopped because uh, he was just on his computer because somebody sent it to him. We'd be sitting at a desk in the back in the FBI, and somebody would have, he'd be having a conversation. He'd have like twelve windows open, having conversations with people. Like, oh, hey, this is vulnerable. Here's the vulnerability. Here's the hack. Uh, if you want the dump, here it is. And no one knew that no he was working knew. with you guys. No one had any idea. And they had contingency plans too. That was the cool thing about. Explain. So his crew had hacked into a. Um, the water supply system of a major U.S. city, and they were sitting on that, and they had hacked into, I, I'll tell you if we turn the mics off, uh, a major portion of the government uh, and was sitting on an email server of that. Um, and, and they could have leaked it all at any point. That was the plan. If someone got arrested and word got out that they got arrested, we're dumping it. That was the plan internally. Um, and we worked flawlessly enough that uh, that he never they never found out he was working on it. Uh, to another point, uh, this is another fun story we ju I just told on the podcast the other day, um, that there was a guy in Ireland, one of the underlings. The, there was lower channel hackers, the, the six guys in the little second, the people under it. Uh, this guy, his dad worked for, his was part of uh, the um, IRA okay. uh, and taught him security and all that sort of thing. And... Uh, he knew that he lived in Ireland that didn't have a lot of uh, cyber cops in the Garda. And so he hacked into the main cop's email and just sat on it. And he, he waited. He saw all the traffic of the fucking cop's emails. Yeah. Well, the, the, ma the yeah. major cyber cop, the, the, his emails. He sat there and waited. And he didn't know when he would use it, but he used it. Um, there was a, every Thursday we had a phone call. Uh, 
we would talk to the Garda and the Met and all the other people involved. And this was a pretty big case, you know, in the FBI. And so it grew. Everybody wanted to have a little piece of it, join the call, bosses and all that. So it was like 50 people. Um, yeah, <laughs> Holy I know. shit. So I'd send over the phone number and the passcode and log all in and all that. And so we had the phone call and talked and probably talked for like half an hour, you know, this is going forward. We're going to move this forward. And I led the call because I was the case agent in the U.S. side. We had the major source. They had their people and they were watching them and all that. That night, I, about 1230, I got a uh, call from Hector, frantic and all that. I woke up. I mean, I, mean, I was working like 18 hour days. It was yeah. like seven days a week. It was crazy. Drinking from a fire hose, literally. And he's frantic. And I'm, dude, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And he says, I'm going to send you something. Take a listen. So I sat on the edge of bed and hit, a, hit my iPad, hit play. And it was a 28 minute auto file of that phone call I had that day. It was an FBI phone call I had that day with the guard of the Met and law enforcement all over the world. And the Lulsec underlings had that fucking recording, and they released it. The, they so they I sent over the username, and the, the login number, and the thing. They just logged in first. I didn't hear the beep at the beginning of the call, and they recorded the whole fucking phone call. And then they, the the kid, he was smart. He sent it to the one person he knew he could trust. He sent it to Sabu. Didn't release it. Sent it to Sabu and had for, no! Sabu, for Sabu to to deal with. Sabu's the leader. Sabu. Guess so what you guys got. never you guys never mentioned him never like whatever on the calls. We talked about having a guy. We never said Sabu. We never said Hector. Ah, shit! Fucking luck, man. No way that that was planned. That I didn't say. Oh, so no, oh, that was <laughs> just, just like, your fucking luck. <laughs> Holy, yeah, shit. yeah. The gig would have been up right then and there. That kid would have. So that kid out. sends it to Sabu, and now he thinks him and Sabu know a secret that no one else knows. So the relationship grows stronger. Now he's like sending yeah. whatever. Yeah, there's somebody on the inside. Uh, we Holy know there's somebody on the inside. We, we might be fucked. So let's tighten up our security. Holy shit. Yeah, that got me on a plane over to Ireland the next day. Did you guys pick him up? <laughs> uh, we didn't, but I was there for his arrest. Yeah. No, we, we waited. But we had to go over and tell the guy. We couldn't email him. So your shit's hacked. <laughs> <laughs> so. What, so if you're the top cyber cr- uh, like cop, I guess, yeah. in Ireland, yeah. and you get hacked, and then the FBI shows up to tell you that you're hacked, what's your reaction? Not happy? Yeah. I mean, it, was, it wasn't pleasant. I don't know what yeah. the outcome was and the whole thing, but yeah, yeah it, didn't, not good. it didn't go over well. Okay. So, like, now you almost have, like, uh, you've got the John Gotti of hacking, let's yep. call him, yep. and people are just sending him all this shit. Like, how long does this go on for? Eight months. For eight months straight, nobody knew? Nope. And so how many arrests does this lead to? Like, it's just, like, really spidering out now, and you're like, oh, we're fucking winning? Yeah, I mean, really came down to the arrest of Jeremy Hammond. It was the guy in Chaos, the guy in Chicago. Okay. Um, we had to get Tell him. That story. Jeremy, Jeremy's arrest or? No, just, just like what, what he did. And like so why he was the him. guy, that Anarch Chaos, that was uh, sending all the police information, and it was just getting out of control. So okay. once we, he was using Tor. Okay. Uh, we couldn't figure out who he was for a long time. Uh, it was found out. We collected all the chats. We gave them to a junior guy, and he found all these different things about it. Like Jeremy uh, Anner Chaos talked about, do, I was involved in a fight at this RNC event one year. Uh, and so and, and we pulled all the arrest records for that event. Um, I did this. I get my internet this way. So it had to be, we knew it had to be a cold city. Ended up being in Chicago, this guy. He had been arrested previously, um, and he was an anarchist freegan. Um, living in Chicago. And so we, uh, we finally figured out who he was. Um, fun story for him. Uh, we, we figured out that he lived in the back bedroom uh, in the house, and we needed to get the laptop. We needed to get it open. The hardest part— You needed to get open why? The evidence. We need the evidence. We need to make sure what he had. Because if it's not open, then they can just wipe it with, like, one, one keystroke? It's crypt- it could be. It could be like a degausser, a big magnet that wipes the hard drive immediately. Yeah, people talk about it. I've never seen it. Yeah. Um, but encrypted. If it's encrypted, Doesn't strong matter. password, it's, it's, it's gone. It's yeah. you know, good enough. So so air gap, closing the air gap, that distance between the fingers and the keyboard. That's really what you have to get. And that's what juries now want because of CSI and all that bullshit. Uh, they, need, they need who was typing on the computer when the hacking happened. And so we needed Jeremy online. So we put Sabu. Are you fucking serious? Like yeah. you literally have to get him. The If somebody's committing a crime now, it's literally like we need it in the act. If they're going to fight it, yeah. I mean, Holy again, shit. you know, we'll talk about it in, in a few yeah. minutes about why it's important. But yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, so you know he's in the back bedroom. Yep. And that's where the computer you're assuming is? Well, we, so we put him online with Sabu. Him and Sabu's in New York in our back squad room talking to Anarch Chaos online. Um, <laughs> we, we figured out 
because of Wi-Fi stuff, he was in the back bedroom using Wi-Fi mm-hmm. on the computer, and it was off the kitchen. Um, so, and, it, and this is like uh, uh, I know, like local cops even have the ability. They've got like the fucking backpacks that are able to almost be like the middleman uh, with the uh, uh, cell phones usually. But like I'm assuming there's some more technologies you can do it with computers as well. If you say so. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I just read things on the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we figured out he was in the back bedroom. Um, and uh, we. By the uh, way, my go- everyone knows this now. Like, whenever I have a guest that I don't know a lot about, like, I just start out with, like, what is the dark web? <laughs> it's my Google search. All right, go ahead. Um, and so we got permission to use a SWAT team to, I think it was the first time the FBI used a SWAT team to, to make an arrest. Um, and we got to use CCTV. So we got to watch it happen. The, the guys had the cameras on their helmets and all that. Um, Jesus Christ. They knock the door down, throw a flashbang in, boom, enter into the house. For a hacker. For, well, yeah, this was a hacker, but going yeah. after cops and, yeah, you know, yeah. and all this other stuff. Um, they go in and dynamic entry, you know, the SWAT team, you in the military, we go into where the most dangerous situation mm-hmm. is. As they come in, there's about 20 kids in the front room smoking pot. And so that's where the SWAT team goes. Um, this is kind of like a communal house, I guess, when mm-hmm. we got in there. Mm-hmm. Um, the last two guys, the SWAT team guys through the kitchen door, looks to the right, and Jeremy closes the laptop. Locked up. Done. Um, so, so it didn't work. Um, but... Uh, we were able to figure out that the password was uh, like Chewy12345. Shut the fuck up. It was the cat's name. Yeah, we didn't try that one, but. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, You're talking about one of the top hackers in the world or whatever. You know, basically he's <laughs> fucking with cops all this stuff. And his password is literally something that like a uh, six-year-old kid would think of. Um, yeah, but it was long. So that's all it needed to be. As long as it had enough characters, a Chewy12345. It was uh, fairly long. And so it Why was does a good the password. Length, why does the length matter? Because brute force, uh, if you're going to brute force it open, you just, you try, it's just like a pat, like a, a, one of those bike locks, you know, mm-hmm. you try zero, 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 one. Mm-hmm. The, the longer, longer it, is. it is, the harder, the longer it's going to take to get yeah. through it. But we finally did get through it. Okay. Uh, how did you find out that it was Chewy one, two, three, four? Brute force. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, I don't know if that, I mean, the FBI has a, a lot of computers and you spread that out over time um, over, you know, this computer does a little bit of this and this yep. computer, you know, and you can do the passwords that way. Now, that's not positive that that is his password. That's the problem with the brute force. That's a password that worked. So you have to say that. Oh, interesting. What is the difference? Um, there could be another password. Whoever wrote the password software, you know, two passwords could work. It's theoretical and only done in labs, but you have to say that. I mean, you know, in computer science, it's like saying a random number. There's mm-hmm. no such thing as a random number. It's yep. pseudo-random. It's the same thing with passwords. We're not positive that's what he typed in, but... Did That's a password that worked. Did you ask him? Nah, no, there was no. no reason to. Yeah. How long did it take to brute force it? It's like six months. Oh, okay. So it was like, a long time. Yeah. But still, I'm, I'm shocked that you were able to do it. Yeah, we didn't. It's a, you, you know, you just try it because you, you have it there. Um, most times it doesn't work. If it's much, yeah. It's so very most times complex. it doesn't work, but every once in a while it does. Yeah. And would it have been easier or harder to brute force? Like, is length the only thing that matters? Or like, if somebody has a password with a bunch of characters and uh, uh, symbols and all that? Like, So that makes it harder. But uh, from our end, you have to assume that it has all the special characters. Mm-hmm. Um, you, there's certain types of things you can do. And we do this in like, in uh, at, at our company. We do this with, um, you know, like crypto recovery. Mm-hmm. It, certain programs don't use certain characters in certain times. If you look back in history, um, so it, it takes out all those combinations. Got it. So it makes it a little easier. Okay, so it like slums it down. Yeah. All right. So what happened to that guy? Uh, ten years. He got ten years. So that. he's still in prison. We, nope, he's out now. No. Okay. Uh, he we did a we did a, a reverse proffer. For, so with Hector, the queen for a day, it's called a proffer session where you tell everything. We in a proffer session. Yeah, it's a proffer session. Okay. So we did a reverse proffer with Jeremy and told him all the stuff we had against him, and then he's decided to plead guilty. Got it. So a reverse proffer proffer is like, hey, we're going to charge you with all this stuff, but if you just plead now? Nope. Now we're going to charge you. This is all the evidence we have against you. If oh. you go to trial, this is what we're going to use against you. Mm-hmm. And unbeknownst to him, the program that he was using for hacking uh, stored all his keystrokes. So his whole history of everything he was doing was they, on his computer. Why do they store all of it? It's easier. It's easier to go back and copy and paste or if you miss something, you know. I, again, I, I don't know why you would keep a log of committing a crime, but... That's crazy. Is that common? Like every computer that's pretty much has that? No, no. He was using specialized software. Yeah, okay. All right. And how much, I guess, of this is like skill versus like they just know the right software to run? Uh, Hector and Jeremy were, were, had skills. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, they also had friends that they would offer them what's called an O-Day or a zero day. It's a vulnerability in the software. Um, so somebody else found the vulnerability, but basically like they don't got the courage to do it. They so don't. They, yeah. They're like, they're probably, they probably are like, 
do cybersecurity at a company during the day, but they like to research and mm-hmm. kind of live in that world at night. Mm-hmm. And they just send it in or something like that. Yeah. Share it with those guys. And then uh, Sabu uh, or whoever will go and they'll exploit it because, yeah. like, that's what they do. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, and now there's in hacking, there's teams like that now. You have different teams, people that find the exploits, people that exploit it, and then the people that will go in and dump it out, and then the people that will sell it. I mean, they're all different stages of, of hackers. Is, is this like, like the new organized crime? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they build teams. Yeah. And, yeah, it's online. How, how prevalent is it in the world? It's, it's bad. It's getting yeah. real bad, especially, you know, with these onion sites that we talked about. You know, yeah. people, like, have their pages right there. Uh, ransomware. I mean, these guys have pages. You can go and chat with them if you want to. Mm-hmm. So... It's crazy. Um, all right. So you get uh, the guy in Chicago. Yep. How do we get to Silk Road? All right. So Jeremy was using Tor. Uh, we took down Anonymous and, you know, kind of that whole thing, rested all those guys. And Hector is Anonymous and Lulsec. Like Anonymous, like, Lulsec, and all that, and exactly. the whole big takedown. It got a lot of attention. Um, we sort of, sometimes in the bureau, depending on where you're at, um, you do a big case like that. You're working 18 hours a day. You work for nine, 10 straight months. You know, the, the boss is like, Hey, go get to remember your family. We'll see you in a yep. few months. Yep. Um, at the, like, the cases closing type, uh, I don't want to say party because we're not celebrating people's arrest, uh, yeah. get together. Um, the prosecutor said to us, oh, what's next? It's like, what's next? I'm going to go meet my family. I'm going to go remember yeah. what it's like to not work 18-hour days. But, you know, we were young and wanted to get going. Yeah. Um, Bitcoin was out there and Jeremy was using Tor. And, you know, people kind of saw us like, oh, you got past Tor. And not really. We use all those chat logs to kind of find where he was. Yeah. But we were finding more and more around that time. This was end of 11, 12, somewhere around there, that FBI cases were coming to an end and just being closed because, oh, IP came back to tour, case closed. We can't do anything. Interesting. So we said, let's take a look at this. Let's see what we can do. What, what can we find? Um, and so we opened up a case with uh, 27, 26 different um, Dodd Onions, and Silk Road was number six on the list. So this is just a random case that was using Tor, and you guys just start checking each one of the, like, websites? Uh, yeah. So, again, we were doing computer cyber intrusions at the time. So what uh, is that? Um, criminal – sorry, it's criminal cyber intrusion. So hacking tools, hackers for hire, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. We had to, you know, the – because of politics, we had to find uh, uh, some sort of hacking thing. So Silk Road sold, you know, hacking dumps and uh, hacking tools. So so if Silk Road never had that, you guys would have never been able to do anything? My squad. My squad wouldn't have gotten involved because mm-hmm. RSAC at the time needed some sort of nexus to hacking. So okay. uh, even though the prosecutor, uh, the Southern District, had been working on Silk Road for a while. Oh, they had been? Yeah, traditionally through the DEA. Um, they're looking they for drugs. Looking for drugs and buy their way up, just like we talked about with the mafia. Mm-hmm. Uh, they tried to buy drugs, but that person had no idea where, where the drugs came from. Yeah. So – you almost have multiple law enforcement agencies that are trying to figure this out. And at the time, did they understand what it was? Or are they just like, I don't know, like, just like, we found somebody who said they bought drugs here. We like have like somebody bought hacking software here. Like, it was almost like you knew the outputs, but you didn't really know what that it was a marketplace or could you like go onto the marketplace? You go to the marketplace. Okay. Yeah, we all so knew So you knew it that it was like dark web eBay or what, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think they, um, the Senator Schumer had mentioned it on the, the floor of Congress that it needed to be a problem. It was a problem needed to be taken care of. So mm-hmm. it, it was known out there in, mm-hmm. in law enforcement uh, of this thing. Um, and I think as our case in sort of side inside tour kind of evolved, we knew that Silk Road was sort of the, the golden ring. Um, I say the golden ring, but it would be the biggest splash. So as you're going through this, at what point are you like, oh, we think that we have made progress, right? Because I'm assuming there's a bunch of like things that you're doing. You're talking to other agencies, like whatever. And like people have been trying and trying and trying. We weren't no. talking to many, many people. No. So it's just you guys were just doing this as yeah, kind of like a one-off thing. Yeah, okay. we would. At what point are you like, oh, well, we think we've got something or we, we think we've got an angle or like a uh, uh, we think we can make progress here? When we came back from Iceland with a server. Explain. <laughs> well, we had found the server through uh, law enforcement techniques, through, you know, uh, traditional gumshoe, te- you know, cyber techniques. And uh, what, is that? what does that mean? Uh, you can't say? We, we, yeah. I mean, it's all out there publicly. Okay. It's, it's real nuanced and all that. But we, you know, we went to Iceland and we met with the law enforcement there. Uh, they, we told them what the case was. We told them what was going on. Uh, and they opened a case and they made a copy of the server and gave us a copy. Okay. So 
you use whatever these things are that are probably too complicated for me to understand. Uh, and it points to there is one server in Iceland that is part of the Tor network? Uh, yes. It, it, so okay. it, but that's also housing all of the code, is, et cetera, for um, uh, Silk Road. Yeah, we didn't know at the time. Uh, we, we we believed that at the time that, it, that that's where Silk Road lived and not until we got back and was able to take a look at it. Okay. Is it common for these services to live on one single server or do they kind of get spread out? And- back then it was pretty common to live on one. I mean, okay. Tor is kind of slow and so spreading it out kind of, I mean, you have mirrors and that makes it faster because it's on more in one site. Mm-hmm. Um, but back in the day, it was pretty pretty common just having yep. one one. All right, so you guys get back with a copy of the server. Uh, does the server operator know that a copy's been made? Nope. No. Okay. So you guys have a copy. Uh, what do you do? Um, first, we didn't think we could get into it. We thought it was encrypted because uh, it was when we put on our machine, look at it, it was encrypted. Come to find out the Icelandics encrypted it so it would be secured coming to us. Uh, so we got the password from them, opened it up, and it was wide open, which was kind of surprising. Uh, most times you would encrypt a, a server mm-hmm. like that, but but this one was just open. Um, it was the Silk Road, the entire database, everything that had ever been sold on it, all the records of it, everything was there. And Holy plus it's uh, it's communications network, like who had been logging into it, who, you know, where the different IPs it was talking to mm-hmm. and all that. Uh, and there's like, Real names or all the uh, pseudonyms? All pseudonyms. Okay. Um, what do you do once you realize, like, basically got the records? We start mapping things out. Um, we start, you know, who's this computer talking to? We do the traditional cyber investigation, you know. So we found out that that computer was making backups to a server in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Uh, got a search warrant for that and got copies of that for anything we were missing. Um, and then tracked all the different IPs and um, subpoenas went out for the IPs that were, were hitting the server. Mm-hmm. And as you're watching this kind of play out, I'm assuming you have like a small team that's working on this. When do you say we have something that we think connects to uh, DPR? Um, it's a little bit further into that. So there was a meeting down in D.C. is a deep confliction meeting, and um, we didn't go down to it. Well, what we, is that? Uh, it's where all the agencies that have been working on Silk Road kind of came together and laid their cards on the table. Um, is there politics between the agencies? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of the term sweat equity was put into it. Sweat equity. Yeah, like I, that? Like, I mean, like, I've been working on this a long time, but I'm still nowhere to go. I deserve whatever you found just because I worked on it for longer. That's it. how I took it. Got it. <laughs> so, got it. Got it. Okay. Got it. Got you know, it. I just <laughs> so like. Are all the cards actually laid on the table or is there like posturing? Like, well, we, um, we have this thing, but like, we're not ready to show it to you. So I think there was three different groups. There was a group out of Baltimore doing their thing. There, okay. That was a whole bunch of different agencies, but not the FBI. It was like Secret Service, DEA, HSI. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was the FBI, us in New York. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy, a lone HSI guy out in Chicago named Jared Derrick. And um, Jared had, he was working at O'Hare Airport and he saw a package of drugs come through. And through investigation, he figured out that that drugs was a shipment part of Silk Road. So he opened up a case on Silk Road and was running it on his own. <laughs> Chicago O'Hare Airport. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, <laughs> so that's pretty that's pretty fucking crazy. Yeah. So, you know, we were getting a lot of pressure from uh, the guys in Baltimore, sweat mm-hmm. equity and all that to, to the point where I was just telling my daughter yesterday um she was asking about like the the carl force who was a dea agent and um she says i remember you talking to him once and we, I, we were on a trip up in in um so we had had the server and we were on a family trip up in in um, vermont and i had to pull to the side of the road because carl called me and was like i'm coming down i'll be there tomorrow i want the server you're gonna give me a copy i'm gonna look through it and all that and i thought it was just this sweat equity mm-hmm. shit mm-hmm. um come to find out carl was dirty and he wanted to know what evidence we knew about what he was dirty doing so um that's a whole different story we'll get to that yeah part it's a, a whole second. different story but uh, so um all right, so you guys start to do this work. You go down, everyone shows their cards. I didn't go down. I, you didn't. I just went through video. Okay, so everyone else is there. They're showing cards, whatever. Not the Baltimore guys. They didn't show their cards. The only person that showed their cards was Jared. He stood up and said, this is what I got. The Chicago. This is where I am. Guy. Yeah, and come to find out, he had worked his way up as an undercover, and he was working into the uh, the admin. He wasn't quite there, but he was working his way up. This motherfucker worked at the airport, and he it was undercover, like, just rogue? I mean, he's an agent. He was a gun yeah, okay. oh, agent, so, okay. he, he was, right. so it wasn't just an airport worker. But, yeah, 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 But he was assigned to the airport. That was his office, with, you know, packages coming into the United and who States. Did he, who did he work for? Uh, HSI, Homeland Security Investigations. Oh, okay, all right, so, got it, got it. Okay. So, so like, he's working at the airport, but he's yep. part 
part of like the Homeland Department. Yeah, yeah. Else. Okay, got it. Uh, and so he worked his way up as an undercover agent and now is not an admin, but like pretty fucking close. Pretty close, yeah. Okay. When he tells you all that he's done that and he's got all this, inf- what do you use your guys' reaction? Let's partner with him. Okay. Because this other group is trying to sweat you know, equity. Yeah, push us out and sweat equity bullshit. All right. So you say let's partner with them. What happens now? I called him. I said, hey, this is what we got. It sounds like you have a good insight on the organization and what's going on. And he flew up to New York the next day, and we sat down in the back room, and we, we talked it through. And I, I showed him Silk Road. Uh, Tom Kiernan had rebuilt the server to run just stand on a standalone computer. We could log in as anyone. We could see any chat of any person. Oh, um, shit. And we saw everything. We had the, we had the back. We, we had everything. How do we get from that to the library? Fast forward and all that, and we find, you know, Jared makes his way up to admin. Um, Jared has seen that um, we... um, And what is his name on the site, Jared? He had a bunch of different sites. I don't remember which one. one, Um, But he had made his way up to admin, and Ross had a, sorry, this time DPR, Mm -hmm. had uh, a Jabber server um, that they were talking on. And we saw that the Jabber server was set to Pacific, Oti- Pacific coast time. So pretty sure DPR was on, and he had sent instructions to all the admins. So we had, now we had West coast. Um, and is that like a big deal that you're like, Oh, at least we know it's the West coast. One out of 24, every time sons are are, that's not bad for us. Yeah. Uh, okay. so, so we're moving forward. And that, gi- that gives a sense for like, I mean, it's a little needle in a haystack to like, yeah. now yeah. you're one twenty fourth of the way there. Yeah. Okay. We had, we had a computer that always, we knew the admin was logging into a computer called, Fro- from a computer called Frosty. So, you know, when you okay. set up your computer, yep. you name it. Mm-hmm. Frosty was all, he was the main admin coming into Silk Road all the time and mm-hmm. what was going on. So we knew Frosty. Um, there was another, an IRS agent that had done some history and looked back uh, in time um, and saw that right around the start of Silk Road, someone had posted on a, uh, on a forum that said they needed help running a underground like a web server type thing mm-hmm. that ran on Tor and, and re- used Bitcoins. And if you could help them out, um, could you reach out at ross.albrick at gmail.com? So our world, that's a clue. So we look into this. There's a guy named Ross Albrecht living in the in the um, West Coast in San Francisco, um, and he posted that post under the name Frosty. Um, so we had our clue of the so only like, someone that had the Silk Road server would know that that his computer was named Frosty. And Ross Albrecht, so that's a clue. Started doing surveillance, found out that when DPR was online, Ross Albrecht was using Tor out of his house. Um, more clues came together, put everything in an affidavit and flew out to San Francisco. So do you find him without that original post? Um, maybe, 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 I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, that's but that, was the, that was the like breakthrough at, at that point in the investigation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so each piece couldn't be used independently, but put together. Mm hmm. The collective Became was enough to get a 46-page, uh, you know, uh, arrest warrant. Okay. When you guys fly out there, like, you're going to arrest them. I had the arrest warrant pocket. I'd already been to the judge in Southern District. He signed an arrest warrant I had a, for, for Ross Albrick, a.k.a. DPR. Okay. I've read, uh, I forget the name of the book, uh, talks about in the library. American Kingpin by Nick Bilton. Yes. Great book. Um, so my understanding is that he goes to a public library. It's using the internet there. Yep. What is this, like, his hands are on the computer, but you guys get him to basically take his hands off the computer? So we were at a cafe in Spotify in San Francisco. We stuck out pretty well. Uh, we get there and— <laughs> I was just going to say, is it like, you know, the whole, like, local cops donuts, like the whole thing? Got bulge. It. Yeah. I cargo got pants. I mean, seriously, <laughs> man, we stuck out like sore thumbs. But You're not a tech worker? <laughs> no, no. And so— um, we, Everyone's just clearing out of the coffee shop. They're like, feds! <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. The first day, um, nothing. He didn't, he didn't come out. Nothing was going on. We had There was a surveillance team on, on his house. Okay. Um, second day, got a call. He left his house and he has a laptop bag over his over his um, chest, uh, carrying it. And we're in a cafe, just kind of sitting there waiting down the street and around the corner. Um, I come, we all leave. I leave and take a left, go in the crosswalk, and he's right there in the crosswalk. He, like we face to face. I mean, throw him on the ground, arrest him, case closed. I let him go. Wait, wait, wait! wait. I don't know this part of the yeah. story. So when you walk out of the cafe, you go left. 
and he's, he's right there in the crosswalk. In the crosswalk, we 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 cross. And you have the arrest warrant with you. It's in my pocket. And you don't say I don't or let do him anything. go. Okay, why? Jeremy Hammond. I had to arrest him with his keys on the finger. Like if that thing was encrypted, or we, he had said that maybe he had a degausser, you know, something to ruin the evidence. I needed that laptop. The laptop was more important than the person at the time. Okay, so uh, I'm going to make a connection okay. to what you just said. Um, if it wasn't law enforcement, it wasn't the Ross situation. Because I know there's there, there's a lot of people who have different views on this. So I, I want to make sure that you have a chance to kind of talk about it from your perspective. But sure. uh, let's just say that you were in business and uh, you had had an experience. You learned from it and you did it again. That is a story as old as time. But in some way, from a law enforcement perspective, a previous event that you guys had been involved in, you actually learned yep. and adjusted your tactics, yep. right? Whether people agree with it or not. And that's why you don't end up arresting him right there. A thousand percent. It's the only reason I did not okay. throw him to the ground and arrest him right there is the arrest of Jeremy Hammond and yeah. learning from that. Okay. So where does he go? Like you pass him. Pass him. Are he, you like immediately like on a walkie talkie or nope. do you have a cool earpiece? And you're no, like, no, 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 no. Cause so this is like, I'm already, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm already sticking out. So, yeah. and I look like a cop, I, you yeah. know, so, you know, I go past and I take a right and go across the street and hopefully somebody else is watching him and they are. Uh, and we're just texting. It's just a text chain going back and forth. There's no radio communications. We don't have radios. We don't have radios that work yeah. um, because we're from New York. Um, I, I brought Tom Kiernan with me. He was, uh, he, and I brought Jerry Derry again and I brought another guy named Todd with me um, out, out there. All New York guys. Well, Jerry's a Chicago guy. He goes into the cafe we were just in. Realize it's a little crowded in there for him. So he goes next door to the library and he goes upstairs and he sits in a window. Jared and I kind of circle around and come back and we sit on a park bench outside a hardware sh shop um, and can see up in the window that Ross is sitting at a table and opens up his laptop. Well, Jared. So you guys can literally see him. We can him. literally see him. Jared opens his laptop and now I always say that maybe Ross was a little kind of understood that maybe I'd look for police cars coming or something like that. You know, um, that's why he sat by the window. I have no idea. Um, Jared opens his laptop, sit on his bench, and we see that DPR just logged in. I got Ross with a computer open, just open, DPR just logged in. Okay, so this is, like, kind of a crazy thing, but, like, this is the first day you ever see him in person. Yep. And, like— The sidewalk. When I, the, it's, like, the, game on. Yeah. So, like, you've, you have now visually seen Ross for less than 30 minutes, 20 minutes, and, like— 20 seconds? Yeah, and now you're already, like, <laughs> okay, cool, game on. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. How do you get from bench to? So he opens it up, starts logging. Jared sends him a personal message. See a guy or see the guy up there typing. Message comes back, back and forth, kind of serious reaction. Hundred percent, we got our guy. This is we've closed that air gap. Mm -hmm. Good to go. Um, there was a surveillance team on uh, on Ross, and like surveillance teams are really good in the FBI. Like you okay. would never know that you were a surveillance team. Hector will tell you today that he knew he had a surveillance team on him. I think it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell him to his face. I think it's bullshit, but okay. he swears he knew it was coming, but Ross didn't. Ross sits at this table, opens the laptop. He's running his billion dollar empire um, at the table. A little, uh, uh, um, a female agent, maybe five feet tall, maybe sits down across the table from him, plain clothes. And she starts reading a book. Um, Ross is drugs are in it up. Uh, and then a female agent, an older female agent and a male agent walk in behind Ross. And, um, you know, I, everyone knows, I said, get the laptop. The laptop's the important part. We'll get Ross. He's not getting out of the library. Get the laptop. So the older female agent cocks back and punches the male agent right in the jaw. Whoa, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, I heard that there was a disturbance. I don't think I knew that they punched him. The older female agent who's walking behind Ross punches the male agent, the male agent yep. to create a distraction. Okay. Ross turns around, the female agent takes the laptop and slides it across the table, hands it to Tom Kiernan, and Tom Kiernan's job was to keep it alive. So that was it. We had the laptop. And, we'll, and you were worried that if he touched it, whatever, something could happen, it could lock. Control, delete. So what did Tom Kiernan, what it was his job? His job was so we had bought, um, we bought a battery pack and every single adapter possible for any laptop ever um, to plug it in, it. keep it alive, and keep hitting space bar and just keep taking, he took pictures, screenshots of the pictures. So that ended up in, in the newspaper later after that of, you know, mastermind. It was always in, the, it was in his trial, you know, that this was the mastermind, the main login for Lulsec, or not for Lulsec, for Silk Road. And that was the computer Ross was sitting at in the library. The pictures have the library in the background 
around. Why is he hitting that. the space bar? Just keep it Just, just keep it alive. It keep it from asleep. locking. We had no idea how long, you know, what the security features were of when it would lock out or anything like that. Um, so punch, yeah. laptop, and then you arrest them? Well, Ross stands up a little bit, and Todd pushes him back down in the chair. As the arresting agent, you never want to be the guy that goes hands-on. Why? Because you want to build that rapport. You don't want to take his freedom from him. Let somebody else do that. I don't know if there's a lot of new agents that do yeah. that. They don't teach that in the academy. Yeah. You want to work with him. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't take his freedom away. Let mm-hmm. somebody else do that. Mm-hmm. So Todd handcu- uses my handcuffs, handcuffs him up. Um, I bring him down. T- I'm at the top of the stairs. I bring him about halfway down to the bottom of the stairs. Um, agents kind of seal off the library because people are like, what the hell is going on? And there's yeah. a bunch of plain clothes guys. No idea the FBI is in an operation. Yeah. I frisk Ross, you know, one of the other things. Turn him around. One, one of the first things I always do is I put my hand right in their chest. Mm-hmm. You know, human connection. I want to, you know, are yeah. you... He was okay. He's about on a heart attack. I mean, yeah. I've never been arrested by the FBI. It's got to be a very stressful day. Yeah. Um, he's fine. We talk. Go out to the car, and that's why I finally show him his arrest paperwork that said, you know, his name and DPR, and I think things, things kind of set in from there. And he is like, you got me? Nope. Oh, no. He's going to fight it. Lawyer. Got so, it. Okay. Read him his rights. No more questions, and that was it. Okay. Um, in hindsight, what yeah. was he r- arrested for? Um, I don't know what the initial charge is. So you, you charge someone with everything you have right there in, uh, mm-hmm. in front of you, and then you supersede the indictment after the arrest mm-hmm. um, with enough information or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. What we find, what we gather from the search. For, we, we did an execute a search warrant on his house right after mm-hmm. that, and so the information we find there. I don't remember what the original charge Did you find were. a lot of – obviously the computer's got a ton of information, but you already had the server, so like you had a lot of information, whatever, uh, in the house and stuff like that. Did you find more? I didn't do the search of the house. I took okay. Ross to jail. Okay. Um, Jared stayed behind and did the search of the house with uh, the local San Francisco FBI. Okay. So, I mean, that's a kind of a strange story. So we were supposed to – we fly out to New York. Mm-hmm. I meet with the San Francisco um, – Case eight, the, the supervisor, cyber mm-hmm. supervisor. And we sit down and we talk about uh, Silk Road and what's going on, why I'm there and all that. Um, and he says, all right, so we're going to make a plan. We're going to go in and we're going to arrest Ross with a SWAT team. And I say, you know, I can't do that. You know, like I, I, I did that before. I tell him the Jeremy story and all that and it doesn't work. And he's like, all right, all right. And he says, all right, how about this? We'll send in three SWAT teams. <laughs> <laughs> and he had some idea of like a helicopter and rappelling and basements and all that. And I said, well, give me a couple of days. And so he gave me a couple of days. The government shut down working at this time. So we're all working for free. And uh, that's in that two days was when Ross came out and we, we arrested him. So, so the next day was supposed to be the SWAT teams and we were doing it because he, he was the boss out there. He was yeah. in charge. Uh, I just remember them. So we called them uh, right after the arrest when we're sitting on this. Ross is sitting in a van um, and all we heard is a bunch of New York fucking cowboys. That's what they called us. Really? Yeah. So as you think about it now, um, I'm going to go to the critics of the FBI first. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of people in the Bitcoin community, uh, specifically, but maybe even broader than just Bitcoin, who say, hey, uh, the war on drugs is dumb. Uh, this guy was running an online drug market. Like, he didn't kill anybody. Uh, he shouldn't be in jail, especially he shouldn't have got sentenced for as long as possible. Like, I won't get all of the, the critics' arguments, but sure. I'm sure you've heard them plenty. Um how do you think about them? Is there any weight or uh, do you put any um, accuracy to the to any of the critiques or do you feel like, uh, no, you guys don't understand the details or whatever? I think there's some of that. And, and it's not the FBI's job to send to somebody. There's, there's judges that do that, judges and juries. I mean, a jury of uh, the way the system works, the jury found him guilty. They, they returned a verdict in three hours, um, which is pretty quick for a jury trial. And mm-hmm. I think they even had a lunch break in the middle there. Um, and then the judge sentenced him. Um, mm-hmm. I was surprised by the sentence, but again, it's not for me to pass judgment. That's, you know, that, that wasn't my job. My, mm-hmm. my job was to bring him to justice. And then the jury and the judge comes up with the, 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 what guilty or not in the, in the sentencing. Okay. So the arrest itself was for operating the marketplace. It wasn't so much for, uh, I've read things about hits and like all, all this kind of other stuff, but like you guys were cyber crime. Hey, we got a guy who's running this. It's illegal. We're going to go arrest him. 
what you're basically saying is like we arrest them and then you essentially hand them over to like a district attorney or whatever. The uh, United States attorney. The okay. Southern you know, District of New York prosecuted this case. Got it. It's so like the yeah. district attorney's boss's boss's boss or whatever. Uh, district attorney are more cities. Um, this is federal level and the federal. Okay. So when you hand it there, then it's like whatever they want to charge them with, the judges, the sentencing, yep. like kind of the, the thing takes off. Given kind of the work that you did up front, build the case, do all the stuff, and you see the sentence, like, I don't know how to really think about like maybe you don't have an opinion on like is the sentence appropriate or is it not right like that's like I certainly don't have a public opinion I yeah. mean I have opinions okay you want to share it no <laughs> <laughs> all right um, and, and so when you think about that entire situation like what are like the big lessons because I think this is like an interesting piece right it's like yeah. there's a lot of people who in hindsight hindsight well maybe not 2020 but like it, it's pretty clarifying for people in terms of like what someone was doing how it went like all this stuff. What are the lessons learned? Well, for me, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't predict anything. I okay. thought this would be the fall of cryptocurrency. Really? Uh, yeah, and I thought that this would definitely be the fall of uh, dark market websites. I mean, Ross was sentenced to two life sentences plus 40 years. I mean, that, that's more than El Chapo. Um, but since then, I think we kind of just made the – we made dark market websites more popular. Um, certainly, my mother had never heard of dark market websites before uh, Silk Road uh, was put in the papers. Um, so maybe we popularized them more. I don't know. I've thought about that a lot. So you thought that uh, the arrest of Ross Albrick and the bringing down of Silk Road was going to actually end Bitcoin? I thought it was going to take a big hit. I mean, okay. I thought people would start seeing it as more of a criminal tool because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, that's the world I live in. I live yeah. in where I, I, I mean, I, I think, like, again, we talked at the beginning, I'm a technologist. I like the technology moving forward, but my world sees the bad side of crypto all the time. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe, the you know, once Silk Road came out there and what was happening on Silk Road, you know, the, the mom and pops of the world would then see, oh, well, crypto's bad. Mm-hmm. When you were doing this inside of the FBI, was it like Bitcoin equals illegal activity, or was it like no Bitcoin's this like bigger thing? And like, of course, there's gonna be bad people who use all technologies, including the internet, cars, whatever. And like, so it's like a small component of Bitcoin. So I'll tell you a story that kind of tells you what the FBI, at least my my perspective, what the FBI thought of crypto at the time. Okay. So we arrest Ross, we find on the Silk Road server and his server together, it's 177,000 Bitcoins. Uh, a pretty good chunk. Even at that time, it was about $200 million. Yep. I had it on a thumb drive. Um, anything valuable goes up onto a, a special safe. It's a walk-in safe in the New York FBI um, that only opens on Tuesday mornings. Unless it's something valuable, they'll open it up to put it in. I told them I had 177,000 and bitcoins and all that they're like the safe opens on tuesday what's well, thursday i was like well i have 200 million dollars what am i gonna do she goes well, you have two million dollars i said no i have 177,000 bitcoins I said safe opens on tuesday i'll see you there and so i had to walk around with a with a you like physically had it with yeah you. i was walking around with it in my on my hand here it is i need all the bitcoins i gotta put it someplace safe uh where'd they, you, where'd they, you put it uh it was on me next to my gun for a long time uh had it my locked in my desk for a little while because i didn't want to take it home um I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, I I went the channels, and yeah. but the FBI just didn't know what it yeah, was. It, it, it was it, it was less about having an opinion as to like uh, this is not worthless. It was more of like we don't know what that is. Yeah, we don't know. We don't understand. I mean, this was you know right after the big you know, it was in the paper and all that, and I was yeah. like, you have okay. to understand. <laughs> so interesting because you had one hundred seventy seven thousand Bitcoin, which yep. now is worth way more than two hundred million. Yeah. Um, there's two other people who had access uh, to Bitcoin throughout all this they ended up taking it that were on the law enforcement side they prior to the takedown before okay. before the whole thing they had done an operation uh, there was a secret service agent and a uh, DE agent who had found an admin and uh, faked his death but he had access to the backside of Silk Road at that time they faked his death or he faked it? They death. faked his death. They they faked, they killed him. Um, Ross asked, so they pretended. Oh, as they're undercover. Undercover. They pretended they were a hitman. And uh, they told Ross they would kill him and get the, get his money back. Um, but really it was them that took the money. Got it. Um, and so that's the whole, like, there's more complexity to, than just a drug marketplace. But at the same time, it was fake. Yeah, I mean, that was the one of, uh, there were six total where Ross had paid someone to have people killed. Um, and you kind of see that, Ross kept a diary, you kind of see that in the evolution of, of, of it, um, where he changed for, it was kind of heartache, have him killed to the other, the last few ones. And again, it was, there was no bodies, he was being tricked, um, was that, uh, you know, oh, we'll just kill the roommates too, was sort of the, the attitude towards it. 
I don't know how I feel yeah. about the like somebody says something, but it's a trick. Like it, it's like intent versus not. Like I, I don't I don't know. It's like a very interesting weird dynamic because usually it's like somebody commits a crime they like commit it or they don't sure. right um how does it, the government it, think about it if we had not found silk road and gone through and investigated all that ross would still would never have known that he didn't kill six people or, or paid to have six people killed so you know what's the difference of, of an attitude if i you know they have all these times where they do the undercovers where wives hire a hitman to kill their husband and the and that's a really a cop it's the same charge. I mean, what, 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 in your mind, what's the difference between that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I guess there's like a, in one way, there's like a, did it actually happen or not? He reached out and the person said I would yeah. kill them. And he said, okay, here's the proof that I killed them. Uh, okay, here's your money. And sent the wire, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, so it's not like the a, wire. He sent the Bitcoins. Or Bitcoin. yeah. <laughs> um, is, uh, okay. When you think about um, the other, I'll, I'll call them, law enforcement or cops or whatever, Secret Service and, and the DEA. Was it kind of like, really, guy? Like, like almost like, a, hey, we're trying to do, like, good work here and, like, this is going to be a distraction? Or, like, what was the reaction when you guys realized, oh, there's, like, other, sh- there's, like, dirty cops in, in, that are involved in this? We weren't part of the investigation. This, that was the Baltimore okay. investigation that started long before we got involved in Silk Road. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were the ones with the sweat equity. Mm-hmm. Um, was it sweat equity? Were they worried that what we were going to find? You know, they did they think they were just operating, you know, anonymously and, and that mm-hmm. no one would ever track this down? Um, I don't know. All these things came into play only in hindsight. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's difficult to tell. Mm-hmm. And is that common? Like that there, I think that people, I think this is right. If I'm wrong, people correct me. I think people associate, like I'll call it just corruption in general, like just like kind of dirty cop stuff more with local police officers. Like like it's almost like kind of petty stuff, right? It's like, oh, they, they arrest somebody, they take $20 out of their pocket. Like again, bad should not happen, whatever. But like, we're talking about like stealing a lot of money, almost like white collar versus blue collar in some way. Um, now, I don't know how people really feel about it. Like, I, I feel like because of politics and all this other shit, like there's becoming more extremism, whatever. Mm-hmm. But like in your experience, you were a local cop and you worked at the FBI. Like how common is that stuff? This is the only experience I ever had in it. Really? Yeah, I never I never saw any of that before yeah. or since. So, so it's like almost... Is it fair to say, like, when it does happen, obviously gets a lot of attention for, you know, proper reasons. Uh, but if it happens three times a year, right, I'm making up a number, and the public hears about it, that seems like a shit ton. But it's like out of, you know, however many, hundreds of thousands of police officers or whatever. Yeah, I I, 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 I would have no idea what the numbers yeah. are, but I, I didn't experience. I, everyone I've ever experienced, especially in the FBI, um, was you know this is our mission. We're we're brothers. We're gonna we're gonna protect each other, but we're not gonna let commit crime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, no one's gonna go over that line. No one wants to risk their career, and they always have a the FBI agents have a sense of right and wrong. I mean, yeah. so you well, know, somebody's doing so. wrong. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know. So, and I guess the last question about the FBI, which. Um, I don't have yet like a fully formed opinion about this because I think it's still like a moving target. But like the politicalization of all law enforcement seems to only be getting more severe, more obvious. And like in some way, law enforcement becomes a pawn in the political game of like one side's like, you know, support the police. The other side's like, you know, defund the police. And then there's like almost like sometimes switching. switching yeah. And, but everything. I mean, politics has been going crazy these days. Yeah. But I hear you. The FBI is in that lately. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, to be fair, I think to the crit- the critics of the FBI, they're like, oh, they're, they're like uh, implementing a political agenda. And then there's like other people who are like, no, like they're trying to do their job. Like you worked at the organization. Like how do you think about just like maybe what they do to try to stay out of that stuff. And then also like, is it just natural for people that make up an organization to have political views? And so like they will get pulled in certain directions. I mean, as a, as a knuckle dragger, the guy doing casework and all that, we, you know, we didn't see that we, like, we didn't see the politicization. I got involved in some pretty high level cases that ended up being in like the basement of the FBI where, uh, you know, I, I, I'd come back and we had this meeting with the top people, the, not the director, but, Everyone below him, mm-hmm. um, people from justice, and it was in the basement. And I saw kind of politics in that. So I can kind of see where it is, but at the the guys doing casework, 
I, I don't nothing. I mean, I, yeah. I I was you know, there's guys you know they're different political parties and all that, but yeah. it didn't change their casework. I mean, we all yeah. had the same mission, um, you know, going for and the violation we were going after. I guess it's almost kind of like uh, there's plenty of people who don't like the politics of Tesla. Amazon, whatever, you know, CEOs, founders, leaders, whatever, but like the barista or the like software engineer may not even have the same political views or whatever. Like they're trying to do their job, go home to their families. Yeah, that's all it is. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 I mean, probably at the upper management, there's some sort of, but, but we're not seeing it. It's yeah. not, it's not trickling down. Like I never, I never experienced personally or witnessed someone say, oh, you can't investigate that or you have mm. to go investigate that. Um, I think that's actually a good way to like, kind of focus it because it's such like a, a wishy-washy thing to talk about like politics right yeah. but like i guess that's really probably the single most like measurable thing would be like are investigations happening for political reasons or investigations not happening for political reasons it's like that's almost where it gets executed right yeah i mean again maybe my experiences are limited maybe i'm naive but yeah. you know i'm pretty pro fbi and <laughs> uh you know it, it's been lately just seeing what's in the news is 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 I don't want to say embarrassing. I'm not embarrassed, but yeah. it's it's strange for me to stand up, you know, FBI, you know, uh, you know I'm like, uh, FBI a little bit. So, yeah. you know, because it's hard to believe what, what I'm reading, some of it. I don't, yeah. I don't think it's true, but I don't know. I think a lot of veterans actually are very similar to this, where uh, I got a fucking flag behind me, yeah. right? Like, I think there's a lot of people who are like, I, I believe in America, I do all stuff, right? But like, you can still be pro something and also disagree with certain things they do. Sure. Like, even if you're, uh, I don't know, a major league baseball player, right? And you're like, I love the New York Yankees. I don't think they should have done, you know, X thing, <laughs> right? Or I wish that we didn't get swept, <laughs> right? But like uh, you can, um, uh, I think, still be like macro supporter, but also disagree maybe on like the individual details. Yeah, you served. Thank you for your service. Yeah. I mean, you, you probably didn't integrate with everything that was going on. But no, you, there was times where I was like, what the yeah. fuck are we doing here? Yeah, but you still you still went because that was your yeah. job. You went yeah. and did it and you served. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's very similar. Um, okay, uh, you don't work at the FBI anymore. I do. <laughs> uh, you had this like, in some people's eyes, like crazy life. Some people was like, holy shit, that's all entertaining. Other people are like, I literally could not last one day like tracking down people and like that's just not what I enjoy doing or whatever, right? <laughs> so like there's a bunch of reactions to kind of think what you've done previously. Moving forward, you now are very focused on like cybersecurity stuff. Talk a little bit about like what are the threats that businesses and individuals are facing and like the business that you're building, what are you guys focused on actually doing? Yeah. So it's really difficult. So we're kind of three things. We're, we're focused on, you know, we build uh, solutions for people, for technology, for people to, you know, that, that, that need it's, it's hard for me to talk around. It. We're building solutions for things that can't be solved. We okay. really like, and that, that R&D section of uh, coming up with solutions to do things uh, is really kind of what excites us. Because mm -hmm. um, these are basically, uh, maybe I can say it and you can't, sure. but like these are really significant cyber threats that uh, whether it's governments, law enforcement, uh, cybersecurity uh, firms, what, people who just operate in this world, they have not yet figured out uh, repeatable software yeah. to be able to either mitigate, prevent, whatever, uh, these threats? Is that like generally? Sure, yeah, we're very reactionary. And so if we can build some sort of solution that helps you to react to something that's happening bad in the world, mm -hmm. um, that's we, we enjoy doing that. So okay. that's one of the things we're focusing on. We're also focused on the cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And we're also, uh, we're big, a lot of our business now is crypto, coming in with people that have been victims of crypto attacks, uh, people who have locked up their crypto and need help getting access to it. Um, Talk about those two. Like, sure. so people who have been victims, somebody's hacked them, stolen stuff. Yeah, you know, we're seeing it more and more. We had a, you know, a victim call us the other day uh, for a friend of a friend, you know, sent us over this information. And the person had looked up an exchange where their, their crypto was at. They Googled it and they found a phone number and they called that phone number. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they called the wrong phone number. Mm -hmm. uh, the person explained to them they could just give them access to their computer and they could help them. Yada, 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 $400,000 in crypto was taken, gone. You know, and these are, you know, retirees. These are people, you know, this and this is not the first phone call of the day even. Yeah. Um, and this is just happening over and over and over again. People are getting involved in the technology but they don't really understand. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity is pretty easy if we just take humans out of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we could just tell people not to touch their computer, yeah. it's pretty easy to secure everything. Is that most of the threat? Is It's like the social engineering stuff? It's the low-hanging fruit. It's, yeah. it's the, the easiest way. And, and cyber criminals aren't going to put in a bigger effort. Why put in a bigger effort when there's so much mm -hmm. in the social engineering and easy to trick people into doing things? Mm -hmm. um, setting up fake websites and just going through people's computers, you know. Mm -hmm. 
if, if you're getting into crypto, put it in cold storage. There's no reason you're not moving it around too much. So especially retirees, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you know, and don't give someone access to your computer. I mean, that's even easy. Um, and then people locking up their crypto. A lot of people, you know, forgot about it. Mm -hmm. We, uh, a journalist friend of mine, uh, his wife had some crypto from like 2014, forgot where it was, forgot the password. We unlocked it for her. How um, do you do that? Uh, it's mostly brute force, but you use, you know, different sort of, you know, techniques to how was it encrypted? How, you know, can we eliminate certain characters? Can we speed things up? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's like on an exchange or and just like forgot my password on the exchange. No, this was, was like cold storage. Stuff. On, on, on our Hard computer. Drive, yeah. Right. That file was sitting on a yeah. computer and stuff like that. Or, or, you know, we'll work on, you know, if somebody has a device uh, and they can't get into it, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing a lot of that work. It's good. Mm -hmm. um, and really, that's kind of really why we, we formed Nexo. It was really kind of, it was, it's the same team that did Silk Road, um, same guys, uh, FBI guys, um, and kind of the R and D stuff, trying mm -hmm. to figure things out. We, we were at consultancies before this, mm -hmm. um, and you know, consultancies want billable hours. Mm -hmm. uh, we really want to focus on doing some R and D and getting back to kind of maybe helping people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people, retirees that lost all their money. If we can even just put them in the right touch with the right people, mm -hmm. you know, it, it makes us feel a little bit better. What are the um, the biggest threats in your mind uh, from like a pure cybersecurity standpoint? Is it like nation states? Is it the like replacement organizations for the ones that you guys took down? What do you see? I mean, if a nation state's coming after you, you're not going to stop it. I mean, okay. there's so many exploits. Let's look at NSO group, Pegasus, and I don't, that's, a, that's a zero click um, vulnerability, uh, meaning that your phone just has to be sitting on your nightstand next to you and they had uh, your phone number. They could then take over your phone. There's what, nothing you do to they, stop that. And what were they doing? Uh, so they, it, was, it was to pull out your contacts, where you were, um, that, you know, allegedly that uh, that reporter was killed off of the information taken from his phone. Um, but, you know, the entry point for that is... They, it, wait, hold on. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi yeah. uh, was killed because... They were mad because of the information they took off the phone, or they tracked him. They tracked him. They were able to track him and find where he was, or, or maybe his wife's account. Again, yeah. all yeah, allegedly. Yeah. Yep. Um, but the entry point for that's five million dollars. So um, we talked about Hector Monsignor earlier. Uh, he and I have a podcast now, Hacker in the Fed, um, where we just <laughs> that, that was Great the name. name. Yeah. So uh, we break that down, and really the takeaway is, you know, your phone is vulnerable. Yes, but if are you going to be attacked by? someone that has $5 million. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not. You might be. So it's something you might want to think about because, no, you know. I'm chill. <laughs> I'm cool with everybody. I'm cool with everybody. <laughs> well, your producer yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I'm cool with everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, th they have those things. And the media stirs those up. You know, that's a mm -hmm. big deal. It's in the news. It's zero click. It, it sounds scary, but you're probably not going to be victimized that. Yeah. You're going to be victimized by the phishing email. Phishing mm -hmm. emails, I mean, people clicking on things. Well, I, I got to imagine that that's like the most profitable business in the world it's for some so of these guys. easy yeah. Yeah. you know you set up a simple page that looks like you're logging into your gmail all of a sudden now you type in your username and password they have it mm -hmm. um you know two-factor authentication they're getting passed now mm -hmm. um we the, just the sms uh, um all of the uh sms uh two-factor that they were basically getting the uh, sim swaps yeah that seems to have died down quite a bit because uh, law enforcement seems to have found a couple of the groups that were like the big perpetrators. That yeah. And it's not, it's again, it's not that easy to, to, to grab somebody's SIM and switch it out. There's yeah. much easier ways. Uh, now they're doing what's called MFA fatigue. Um, so that means they know your username and password because it was sold on the dark web. Uh, username and passwords are all, all over the dark web. Millions. Every time uh, ask.fm was hacked into, there's, there's 300 million username and passwords uh, out there connected to Twitter accounts. That was two months ago. Wait till you see what next 18 months is going to roll out of that. Um, but so now they have your username and password and they just keep entering in the site and you get a thing in your phone that says approve, approve, approve. Eventually you just want it to stop. So you, maybe you think it's your outlook on your desktop computer that's asking for sign in and you just hit okay. And that's how now they're getting past two factor authentication. Uh, MFT, MFA bombing or MFA fatigue is what they're calling it now. So, so literally, you know it's fake, but you just want it to stop. So. You might not know it's fake because let's say you have Outlook on your computer and your work requires you to log in to two factor every 30 days. Maybe it's that. You know, mm. uh, Dropbox, your engineers just got, got hit with this. And mm. these guys are in the security industry. They know not to click on it. They yeah. clicked on it. You know, it's just over and over and over again. Um, so things are moving towards FIDO, FIDO security. So it'll be a token you'll carry around. Mm. You register all your websites. Um, 
And what, what is the it's token? It's better. Do? It's uh, it's it, it sets up a peer to peer encryption. Um, so all the major players have gone to it. Google, uh, Microsoft, everybody is uh, accepting it. So you stick the token in, you register your username, your password, your communication, and then every time now you plug that in, that same connection is made. So it's a it's a passwordless entry system. But you have yeah. to carry a token with you. Yeah. Um, lose that token, you've lost access to all your accounts. So. Get two tokens. Make sure you have a backup. Put that in a safe place. But, you know, passwords are, are the least secure things, and so we need to start moving away from them. Yeah. It. Um. What do you do from, like, a, a security standpoint? Obviously, don't say anything that uh, <laughs> would be too revealing, but, like, what, would, what do you do that um, allows you to sleep at night where you're like, this is a good security measure? I know the risks. I know what the problems. You know, if you if you realize that you're online, you're putting yourself in risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just realize what risk level you're at. I don't have a social media. Mm-hmm. I do that because I have kids, and I really don't want my you know my picture with my mm-hmm. kids. Um, we've had our lives threatened because of the Silk Road stuff. Mm-hmm. So you know, I don't do pictures like that. Um, you know, I I know some sort of posture. Do I? I have an Alexa in my house. I mean, that's a security risk. There's an open microphone list in my house, but it's convenient. It's convenient to order, add to the shopping list or if my wife's not there, she can add to it and that sort of thing. And so convenience versus privacy. Um, you just have to weigh and understand your <laughs> the risk. The battle is old as time. <laughs> You'll never have perfect, but, you know, yeah. it's, you know. And you also have to remember that you're putting your data in the hands of all these other people. I'm putting my, mm-hmm. like, I put all my information into the FBI. The FBI got hacked into OPM, the Office of Personal Management. The Chinese hacked into that and took all that information. There's nothing I can do. I want to be an FBI agent, but mm-hmm. all your information. Think about all the places where your personal information is mm-hmm. um, and realizing that, you know, what, what's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the trends you asked in the future. So we've kind of gone to, you know, away from the password logins. Or we're, we're now doing biometric logins. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're too far away from, like, going to the grocery store and it scans your face and you pay for stuff. Mm-hmm. Um can be scary though. If you lose your personal information, you can go get another social security account number and all that. Mm -hmm. If you lose your biometric information, you can't replace that. Yeah. You can't get a new face. Yeah. What the hell are you going to do if they hack into that and take your face from you? Yeah. Um, You know, and all, all biometric. They they don't want my face, but they might want yours. I've got a face for radio. (laughs) That's why I started a podcast. (laughs) That's why I go on podcasts. Um, You know, but so it's just, we have to stay ahead of these things. So yeah. things like the token, I think that's going to be the solver. You mix the, you know, a token based with your face. Mm-hmm. Very hard to steal those two things. Yeah, it, it feels like uh, it's the cat mouse game. Yeah, right. And yeah. and um, it, it's kind of your career really. I think represents it in terms of your, your you uh, from law enforcement center trying to stay one step ahead. Now from the private sector trying to stay one step ahead. Yeah, I mean we're not going to get the like I said state sponsored. You know those guys are putting. You know they're 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 getting to. If, if they're going after a company, mm-hmm. they're putting, they're hiring the janitor, the lowest paid guy, to mm-hmm. stick a thumb drive in the back of your machine. Mm-hmm. How many people go to the company and look on the back of their machine to see if there's something in the USB port? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a key logger. That's log, sending information home. That's all it takes. It's just mm-hmm. put it in there and it'll, it'll, you'll never find it. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, 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 you can't stop it. it yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. But be a little bit more secure. I, I think that's probably the best way to do it is like I think a lot about security in terms of like you're going to make mistakes, but like just mitigate them like like or minimize the number of mistakes, right? Yeah, minimize them. But also if it's a little bit inconvenient for you, mm-hmm. it's really inconvenient for the hacker. Mm-hmm. And they're just going to go on to the guy who is less inconvenient. They can take over their computer. Yeah. <laughs> why, why, why spend time on it? If I'm a, again, say that's sponsored. a crazy story. Say sponsored. If I'm coming after you. Mm-hmm. I'll get you. You can't stop me. There's nothing you can do. Mm-hmm. But if I'm just going over somebody, I just want somebody, mm-hmm. I'm going to go who's a little bit more convenient to hack into. Yeah. I think that's a great place to end. Uh, where can we send people to find you on the internet? You can't find me. Uh, <laughs> I don't put, that's not a challenge. I'm not challenging hackers, but uh, the podcast, uh, Hacker in the Fed, download. We put out an episode every Thursday. It's me and Hector, uh, Hector Monsignor, Sabu. Uh, we're talking about uh, the latest cyber stories. We tell old little sex stories. People write us uh, emails to ask about FBI questions or old uh, old hacks uh, that we talk about. So it's fun. It's really just time for me and Hector to mm-hmm. sit down and talk. It's it's yeah. really therapeutic, to be honest with you. It's the, the most therapeutic thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, and then uh, my company, Naxo.com, just if you need help with cybersecurity, crypto, or anything like that, reach out to us. Awesome. I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I, I uh, think you've got a, 
an amazing array, I think, of experiences. Um, and I think I appreciate your ability to uh, say, hey, like, this is the things that happened, but also, like, I get it. There's people who disagree with certain things, whatever, and, you know, here's my views. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for coming, and we'll definitely do it again in the future. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much.